Block 1 Audiobook Title Miss Demon Maid, 01-64, by Haru no Hai. This work belongs to author Haru no Hai. Source, NovelUpdates.com 1. The Summoning TN. No this isn't more Bunny Girl. This is another novel from Haru no Hai written about a year or two before that one, and this one has a much more direct connection with Akuma Kuo. Inside a dilapidated castle was an old, dusty room, built out of stone and used for ritualistic purposes. A small magic circle was drawn on the floor, squiggly and deformed. Yes, I did it. It was the voice of a young girl in this dwelling that looked as though it belonged to an evil witch of children's fairy tales. The girl seemed less an inhabitant and more a captive. A child no more than five. She had silver hair and violet eyes, wearing a dress somewhat worn out but distinctly of the noble caste. She beamed at the thing resembling a small slime that had appeared in the magic circle. Her hand stretched toward it as she spoke gently, adorably. Hey, will you be? Drip, drip, cold droplets of water wet my cheek, and I slowly, blearily open my eyes to an unfamiliar ceiling. Just kidding, nothing so cliche, it's just a cloudy sky instead. Hold on. Why am I sleeping here? Question mark. Had it been soft grass that I was feeling on my cheeks and my back, then it would have been possible that I'd accidentally dozed off from the comfortably wide open outdoors, but as it is, I'm currently lying on something hard and uncomfortably angular. Considering the rusty bikes and refrigerators I see around me, this should be the illegal garbage dump near my school. I remember now. I came here to clean up the trash as an extracurricular activity. Looking from the school toward this direction, you'd see a cliff several meters high. And since there was a natural dip in the ground under it, people from nearby towns have been coming here to throw away their fridges and TVs. The unlawful dump had been a bit of a problem. Really? What were they thinking? And while I don't exactly hold the school in high regards for making its students clean the mess up, I think even less of the more idiotic of the students who were only making things worse when they throw away their water bottles and convenience store lunch boxes. At this rate, this dump is never going to go away, and those who contribute to the problem are also the same one who never help out with the cleaning. In the end, it's only the serious students that get the short end of the stick. By the way, who am I? H. Hey, isn't this kinda bad? What the hell are you saying Denko? Didn't you agree to this B but, I mean D did she die? No way. Hey, let's get away already, but our group's gonna be suspected. Then do you have an idea, huh? Wasn't it you who pushed her, Bottom? B but Hina-chan told me to do it too. Oh yeah, I think I remember a bit now. I was pushed by the girls who are, even now, getting into a hullabaloo. Do people still say that these days? On the cliff. They're only speaking about how to protect themselves. I hear nothing about calling for the school nurse or an ambulance. None at all. The cliff looks about five meters high. If below me had been smaller pieces of trash, then maybe they could have acted as a mattress to cushion my fall. As it is, however, it was after our cleaning, and so the only garbage left were the large stuff that the students couldn't deal with. Basically, I was pushed from a height equivalent to the second floor of a building onto a pile of metal, landing either on my head or my back. Yup, that's more than enough to kill. If a person falls from high enough for them to do half roll in the air, then it's also a height very much lethal. I could have broken a bone even if I landed on my legs, and I could have been stabbed by a rusty, broken length of metal from a bike, too. Oh, it's raining. We really should go. Come on. Let's get back to the classroom. I don't think anyone's gonna come looking in the rain, but what if they find her? W we'll just tell them we only poked her a bit and she fell all on her own. It's an accident. Are you leaving? Crack a two oo oo R? Ominous lightning struck at just the right moment, and the three girls screamed in chorus. They screamed because of the thunder, obviously, and not because I'd talked to them after I got up and climbed the cliff. Who would scream when their classmate was just asking them a question? That's just rude. Kei Kamishiro-san? Oh yeah. That's my name. Isn't it? My family name. Anyway, the three girls who pushed me are now staring at me with a bit of guilt, a bit of relief. And a lot of fear. W-Y. W weren't you dead? The blood. It's... It's not my fault. No. Hey, wait. I say, but they're already tripping over themselves in fright as they run toward the school. Come on. I mutter, exasperated. 
They acted as though I should have died. Such rude people. The drizzle turns into outright rain, the beads of water soaking my hair heavily. I absent-mindedly bring a hand to my head and notice a strangely thick wetness on my finger that isn't water. A closer look reveals that my hair is matted with an amount of blood in far excess of a scratch. Ah, I see. No wonder, normal middle school girls are totally gonna be terrified by this. The sky rapidly darkens. The rain is a downpour now, the water beating on the school ground to turn dry dirt into darkened mud in short order. I'm soaked anyway, so I just use the rain as an impromptu shower to wash out the blood, then head toward the girls' locker room to get my change of clothes. I enter the school building, ignoring my indoor shoes, as dirty as I am, changing shoes would just be a waste of time anyway, and go right for the sophomore locker room. I don't meet anyone on the way, the juniors and seniors are probably still in their classes. Luckily, I'm wearing my jersey for the extracurricular cleaning. If I had been cleaning with my uniform, I'd have to go home wearing this eye-searingly red jersey. There's nobody else in the locker room beside me. I take out a small key from my pocket. My memories are getting clearer now. I open the correct locker, my locker, without having to think twice. It's not like it's difficult. Mine is the only one as dirty as it is. I suppose those three girls might have done it because I erased their scribbles from my locker. It's amazing, in a way, how they could be so childish. I take out the towel from my locker, undo the long braid that comes to my chest, and thoroughly wipe off the moisture from my hair. Why'd I keep this? My front bangs go down to my nose like a black curtain. Oh, yes, I kept this so long because I used to not want to let other people see my eyes. When my hair was dry, my bangs only went down to my eyes, so it hadn't bothered me that much, as I am now, though. It just feels really irritating. I take a look around, as luck would have it. There's a sewing kit somebody left behind, and I find what I'm looking for inside. Small, but serviceable. Snip. Locks of hair full to the floor, as amateurish as I am. Getting my front bangs straight was the best I could do. But I still looks a lot better than the walking curtain that I used to be. Now that that's done, I'll have to change. Luckily, my underwear's still dry. I quickly change into my blazer uniform. It's a public middle school's uniform, and there isn't much about it you can describe as cute. Then take a look at myself in the full-length mirror placed against one of the walls. Oh, so that's what my face looked like. The lights suddenly buzz and begin to flicker, covering me in bouts of alternating light and darkness. In the mirror, I see a girl with glossy black hair and dark red eyes. She looks like an unfeeling doll with all the things that were keeping her on the right side of the uncanny valley stripped out. Might have sounded like I was describing someone else, but yes, that's me. Crack krrrr. Another flash of lightning, followed by rumbling thunder, the lighting gives out completely. In the pitch black darkness, a pair of crimson eyes flicker as though candle lights. The town was neither an urban city, nor was it in the countryside. It neighbored a government-designated city and was also adjacent to a national highway. But at the same time, it was why the town was only a place for people to pass by and rarely go into. The town had no lack of households, though the vast majority of them were old families. There were barely any young people. All the children of age within 30 minutes walking distance from the public middle school didn't even take up more than one class for each grade. Teachers late, and we just have homeroom left. To Ginko, the class vice president, a girl with an assertive streak that showed in her appearance, grumbled. I think she's dragging out the staff meeting again. Fua, a timid looking glasses wearing girl, answered. Ginko thought of their homeroom teacher, an old maid with so much enthusiasm in making her students do voluntary service that she half suspected the woman to be involved in some sort of shady religion. And she nodded, convinced by Fua's words. Ginko then released a small sigh. Nevertheless, she understood why the woman was giving them the work. It was this class. Sophomore year, class one, there was just one class anyway. So it wasn't like the numbering meant anything, but the point was, the class only had 17 students who were all in their second year, and yet there was still a distinct lack of unity. The eight male students weren't the problem, they fit together well enough. Part of it was because most of the boys were quiet, but mainly it was thanks to S and how two good-looking students who acted as the leaders to bring them together, despite their somewhat strange names, Saintly Garment and Winged King, respectively. 
On the other hand, it was exactly the two's handsomeness that broke apart the nine female students. Three of the girls were actively chasing after the two boys and sabotaging each other. Another three were watches, who mainly involved themselves in malicious gossip and bullying as an outlet for their frustration. Jinko and Fua, who tried to stay away from the mess, unwilling to be involved in the drama. And finally, a girl shunned by all the other girls. At first glance, the female students seemed harmonious enough. The grade only had the 17 students, plus there was no other class to change to, so the group was tight-knit, so to speak. Now, most of the class just called everyone else by their first names, no matter if they were a boy or a girl, the only exception was the ignored girl. When they had been in their first year, Ginko and her friend had thought to bring the lonely-looking girl into their group, but before they could, the two aforementioned boys had approached her, either out of kindness or a sense of duty and it had been the beginning of her misfortune. Aside from Ginko and Fua, all the other girls began to pretend she didn't exist. Even Ginko didn't think the situation was anywhere close to being good, for sure. But if she had gone ahead with her original plan, the two boys would make things complicated with their own unwanted actions. It was another one and a half year until graduation, give or take a few weeks. The undeniable fact was that she didn't want to rock the boat to have to spend that much time in a class split into two warring sides when there were no other classes to change to. It's kinda quiet today, Fua said, it is, Jinko replied, turning a quick glance around the class. Everyone had already changed out of their jerseys back into their uniforms, except for the three bully girls. They kept whispering to each other, looking scared. That reminds her, where was that girl? She was the only one to not be back yet. Dot and what was her first name again? Crack G R R R R Kaya Wa Ape. A bolt of lightning struck, this time quite a lot closer to the school, and the lights shut off. Several students screamed. The rain intensified, beating down on the building. The sky grew darker and darker. Somebody gulped, and silence descended in the room. My. What's wrong? The voice of a girl softly rang from the classroom entrance, triggering another chorus of screams. Since when had the doors been open? K. Kamishiro. Sans? One of the aforementioned boys, whispered raspily. The confusion in his voice was shared by everyone else in the room. The girl, Kamishiro, had been the target of bullying due to her mixed heritage, being half Japanese and half Turkish. It showed in the lines of her face, the color of her eyes and children were creatures that could so easily reject those different from themselves, even if no one would bat an eye at her once she grew up. The girl had been the quiet type in the first place. Early on in her life, she had realized herself to be different from those around her, and soon afterwards she began to keep her head down, hiding her face. But now, she wasn't doing that anymore. Now, she carried a completely different her a cheerfully intimidating smile on her face, as though she had died and been reborn. Cracked hoo -oo. blinding lightning and deafening thunder drowned out the students' screams. The glass windows shattered, and the classroom was flooded with light. The students continued their screams of terror and shock except for a single girl, the girl named Kamishiro, who showed a look of surprise on her face for a single moment. Afterward, she smiled and slowly closed her eyes in realization and acceptance. Success. Yes. We did it. E e e that's awesome. They're humans. A chorus of cheers mixed with relief came from the students of the Magical Academy as boys and girls appeared from the enormous summoning circle. For many students at the academy, it was the fifth and final school year, the year when they would turn fifteen. The noble children with strong magic among them would summon intelligent creatures from another dimension to contract them as servants called partners. While the summoning was a part of the curriculum, to the students with strong enough magic to handle spellcasting, the partners that they summoned themselves would be their proof of graduation from being magicians to become magi, and among nobles, being a magus was a certain kind of prestige. There were many many dimensions of all kinds to summon from. There had been summonings of dragons, lunar wolves, or other such mythical beasts with both power and intelligence, and there had also been summonings of elves, dwarves, and other such demi-humans that didn't exist in this world. And they were still the safer results. Depending on the school year, there were also cases of monsters such as ogres and trolls being summoned, and it had been the reason for the tense atmosphere and subsequent palpable relief among the students. Now, 
the relief of the Magi in training were turning into loud and excited cheers. After all, the summoning this time had given them humans, life forms of the same appearance as them. Unconfirmed information had it that human inhabited worlds were dimensionally far apart, and so summoned humans were air. Furthermore, summoned humans often gain powerful magic, and legends had it that they only showed up every several centuries. Few in this year's summoning, the students with powerful magic numbered 17. Among them was a severe looking girl with silver hair and violet eyes named Sharon. She rubbed her fingers, trying to relax from the white knuckled grip she had on her staff and she breathed a sigh. Expression still tense. Looks like I managed somehow, she thought. Sharon wasn't very good in her magic control. If the summoning had failed here, she might just become the target of blame from everyone else. As the daughter of a Marquis, she couldn't afford to invite any further disgrace. The cheers gradually died down as the Academy students remembered what they had to do next, and the tense nervousness returned. The servant contract mentioned earlier was a ritual with quite a few similarities to the slave brand curse, and by law, it was only allowed to be used on dangerous subjects such as criminals or monsters. But the summoning of intelligent creatures would have abruptly ripped them away from their normal lives. Rarely were they friendly, they might be fearful due to the change, they might wail in grief, or they might even forget themselves in rage and attempt to bring harm upon the summoners. It was why the tense atmosphere wasn't limited to the students alone. Even the knights standing by, those who had been deployed by the kingdom to protect the young sons and daughters of high nobility, were waiting with bated breath. To the noble students who had summoned members of a sapient species, those to whom the servant contract wouldn't be allowed, not being chosen would be considered a shameful stain on their records. As nobility, they needed to be able to display their worth to the summoned, to convince them to become their partner and servant, and they had one year until graduation to do it. After that year had passed, the partner candidates would be employed by the country. Those who hadn't been chosen would never again have the chance to gain a partner. The results of the summoning this year were children the same age as the summoners. They were seemingly of the same ethnic group, judging from the black hair they all shared. The sudden summoning had made them fearful and heavily confused. There was even a girl among them who looked as though she was about to cry at the drop of a hat, and a few among the student summoners hesitated to speak up, feeling somewhat guilty. The first to speak would make an impression, but also risk being the target of the summoned people's grudges who would take the role. The air was charged with tension as the student's mind whirred with thoughts on how to best approach the situation and how to obstruct their rivals. Meanwhile, Sharon took deep breaths trying to calm her thundering heart, and she began to search among the summoned humans, seeing if any would deign to serve someone like her. The laws only allowed one to summon intelligent creatures from another world once, no more. The reason was because supposedly, the first time was the only time a soul bond could be established, and the partner who had chosen and been chosen by a summoner at that time would empower their master to their maximum potential and the more powerful the soul bond the summoner had, the more likely they would be chosen. But Sharon felt nothing but unease with the knowledge. Dot what do I do if no one chooses me? Sharon had made a mistake in her younger days. A mistake that made this summoning no longer her first. As tension mounted, Joel, one of the students and the second prince of the kingdom, decided to become an example for his subjects. But just as he was about to put his feet forward, one girl walked out from the group of summoned people. Her steps calm and composed. The noble student sculpt, drawn by her presence, by her exotic beauty that could only be born from a confluence of bloodlines, from a meeting of different cultures. They lost themselves in her hair, a gleaming black of obsidian. Her skin, fair and delicate as velvet, and her eyes, a mesmerizing shade of million that spoke of the powerful will behind them. As everyone continued to be captivated by her beauty, the beauty of a doll, she walked onward unmolested even by the knights that were supposed to be protecting the academy students. She headed right for the second Prince Joel, and quietly passed him by, instead stopping in front of Sharon who was standing in the back of the crowd. She daintily pinched her skirt and gave a curtsy, one practiced and full of elegance. Greetings, my lady, I shall be in your service. Please, call me Furuti. In the year 893 of the kingdom's calendar, the month of first fall, Thus began the story of a single clumsy villainess and a maid who came from another world. 2. The Sandbox. A.N. 
The first chapter I wrote turned out to be exactly 6,666 Japanese characters. Hello everyone. Furuti here. The fog upon my mind is cleared. I'm feeling great. My lady's brain still seems to be blue screening. I give her a smile and walk over to stand beside her. Not right next to her. Of course. My place is one step behind her. Then my lady finally reboots, jerking her head around at me like a broken phonograph. WWWW at at last, she blesses me with her adorable voice. WY did you? Um, I'm Fluidy, my lady. F you. Fleur dot Etty, if you're not used to it, feel free to call me Letty. Oh yes, which reminds me, I have not yet asked for your name. My apologies, I am Sharonda. Hold on, why are you standing next to me? And what do you mean, your lady? Lady Sharon says, her hands flapping so much it looks like she's doing sign language in fast forward. I give her a few gentle taps on the shoulder and a smile. Of course, that is because I've decided to serve you, Lady Sharon. Or might you be dissatisfied with me, perhaps? I reply. Eh no, that's not what I meant. I, a moment, please, Sharon. And then some asshole decides to interrupt our heartwarming moment. Right when I and my cute as a button lady were in the middle of affirming our master servant relationship, Sir Joel. Lady Sharon says, turning around in surprise, with his air of composure and striking looks that would probably make him quite attractive to a certain demographic. The guy looks like the quintessential fairy tales prince, even with the slight bit of confusion showing on his face at the moment. Oh, right, I almost forgot, judging from the architecture and clothing I see around me. This world's probably somewhere around the Middle Ages, or maybe nearing the end of it. I also see light sources floating in the air that use no electricity, so I guess we'd been magically summoned. Excuse me, Sharon. Would you allow me a few moments to talk to her? Yes, your highness. My lady answers, looking strangely. Meek, her face now seems sort of stony looking, and her voice sounds stiff. Does she not like this man? This cannot stand. For my lady Sharon, this lowly maid Flority shall send this brute away from the mortal coil. If not for the fact that she called him your highness, a wrong move here might just worsen my lady's standing. Miss, I would ask for your name, he says, his question sounding more like a command. The guy's obviously used to giving orders. Yes, my lord, I am Flority. My name is Joel, and I am the second prince of this country, our Greek kingdom, Miss Flority. Do you understand what is happening at the moment? Why have you decided to serve Miss Sharon? You have been summoned here. That's right. There's no way that half-wit girl could get a partner first. There must be something wrong. So today is the day for interruptions, is it? This time, the one who spoke up was a tall, brown-haired boy. Ignoring the fact that he has just insulted my lady Sharon, just his frivolous-looking face alone is already criminal enough for a sentence of a million deaths. Sir Joel is a real prince in comparison. Cal, enough. You're in the presence of his highness. One of the knightly looking guys standing on guard scolds him. Be quiet, elder brother. In this academy, you're just an imperial knight. You can't tell me what to do. And now they're getting into an argument. What a pain. I'm not so good at remembering people's faces and names, so having so many new characters showing up all at once is way more than my memory can handle. We'll have her choose again after she gets a full explanation. Once she knows who that idiot girl is, there's no way she'd choose someone so inferior. Carl says, all the while ogling me from top to bottom without even trying to hide his gaze. I must say, this doesn't feel very comfortable. My mother had been pretty developed so I'd like to think I inherited a bit of that. But my body is not for your pleasure, Carl. Beside, my own pair is just about average. I would have thought Lady Sharon's huge tracts of land would make the guys a lot happier, right? Anyway, I have to say my lady's bosom is truly amazing. Not like I'd say it out loud, though. My lady, your breasts are breathtaking. May I touch them? WW what are you talking about? My, I accidentally let loose my true thoughts. Unbefitting of a maid indeed, but it can't be helped. There's no way anyone can possibly dislike a cute big boobed girl, be they men or women. You shut up already, the knight from earlier pinned Carl to the ground, eliciting a grunt from him. Your Highness, I must apologize for my brother's discourtesy, pay it no mind. As Carl said, he and I are but classmates of the same year at the same school. He has not insulted me, please let him go. 
The prince says, understood, my apologies to Lady Sharon, as well, the knight says, turning toward my lady, and blinks his eyes several times as if not comprehending the sight before him, no surprise there, he didn't seem to have heard our talk, but he is seeing my lady turning crimson faced as she covered her chest with both hands, noticing something strange, Lord Joel and several others turned puzzled eyes on us, in place of my lady who's looking seconds away from blowing her fuse, I pinch my skirt and smile, trying to pass the matter off as nothing important, um, excuse me, I hear a voice, somewhat nervous, coming from within the summoned, and subsequently ignored, classmates of mine, sis speaking with his hand raised, what will happen to us, ah, after the summoned earthborn students received a quick summary, they were guided into the academy's guest rooms to rest, the detailed explanation would be done tomorrow, the academy had prepared enough private rooms for all of them, but anxious as they were, many had asked to stay in groups of two or three people. Each group was now having whispered discussions of their own in their respective rooms, talking about the day's events. In a room for two, Fua was the first to speak. Hey, Ginko, what's going to happen to us? Yeah, Jinko replied to her best friend half-heartedly. With what had happened, even the strong-willed girl was finding herself at a loss for words. Is there a way to return to their old world? Would they be forced to live in this one? Would they ever see their parents again? What would their lives become? In this world, 15 was the age of majority, while the girls were only 14 this year. Even here, they were still considered children. Their anxiety felt crushing. In an attempt to look away, to not have to face their unease, both began to search for something to talk about. Anything at all. Um, so, about Kamishiro-san. Has she always been like that? I dunno, we never talked much. She walked out so confidently back then, alone, it's like, her personalities switched completely. The two shared the thought. Bewildered as they were of Kamishiro's actions, they still felt as through their worry had lightened, just a little bit, as they recalled the sight of their classmate. And also, yeah, has that always been her given name? They spoke in a chorus, the same question passing through their minds at the same time. Meanwhile, while many of the students were distressed, there were several girls who shared their anxiety only on the surface, inside, they were shouting with joy, these girls knew what this world was, there was a certain at home game with the title The Lines of Light, Darkness, and Love, the game was set in the sandbox world of Fantaria, or to be more precise, the Agri Kingdom inside of it, ten years ago. This game was first released for household game consoles. Despite the content being a typical at home romance game, it had enjoyed a period of popularity among gaming enthusiasts thanks to its extremely detailed setting and dialogue writing for its characters. The game's main character was an explorer who would find her true love among the many, many capture targets. At the end, she, together with her chosen lover, would create a new country of Agri. The game was rather unusual due to having an element of city building in its gameplay. Three years after the first game, the second iteration, Light, Darkness, and Love 2 was released. The developer was a no-name company, and the first game hadn't been exactly a bestseller. So gamers were rather justifiably suspicious of the second title. But once more, the game made waves on the internet. The second game's story was set 200 years after the birth of Agri Kingdom, in the Magic Academy newly built in the capital city. Similar to the first, the amount of possible dialogue were so numerous as to make walkthroughs useless. The game gained popularity for its high replay value, and different from its predecessor, it even had an element of country management such as allowing the player to make changes in the school's educational content or pass legislations. The game was such a mishmash nobody knew what the target audience was, and another three years afterward, the game Light, Darkness, and Love Online was released. The second game had looked as though it took the budget of an AAA game to be made, but there hadn't been any news about it selling particularly well, and yet, the third game seemed to have gone a step even further beyond. Rumors began to circulate on the internet that the games were being made as a hobby of some millionaire somewhere. This time around, the game's peculiarity was mentioned right in its title, it was an online game. Like a certain hunting game, this game allowed people to join password protected rooms to play in groups with a maximum of four people, and they could play as female protagonists in the same game world. The game was set in the Magic Academy of Agri Kingdom, 
Another 200 years after the setting of the last game, the player played as one of the summoned heroines, and their goal was to capture one of the target male characters. Except for when playing with friends, there were cases where two or more people chased after the same target, which sometimes even led to flame wars on the internet, and with its inclusion of an element of action rebounds per game gameplay, the game was the very definition of chaos, and then, at the end of last year, the fourth game, Light, Darkness, and Love Online 2, The Millifell of Love, was released. Once more, the game was so detailed people were outright making conspiracy theories now, about how the developer could afford making a game at such a scale when they had absolutely no other intellectual property to make money from. The newest game was, once again, an online game, and this time it allowed over 10 people to play together at the same time. The stage was set in the Magic Academy after another 200 years had passed, a whole middle school class with 8 female students and 8 male students, for a total of 16, was summoned to the Academy. The player would either play as the first heroine, a daughter of a Viscount, or choose from one of the 16 students. The first twist of this game was that the player could choose to play as one of the male students. Perhaps the game had intended to attract more male players with this decision, but in case the player chose a male student, not only could they choose to seduce one of the villainous female characters, they could even go for the male characters, though the difficulty in this case was stupidly high. This had resulted in the game attracting a lot of girls and women who wanted to see sausages rubbing together. Another twist was that the game was a 3D open world game, something very rarely seen in this genre. There was a character creation process for the player character too, and the students that would become NPCs would be randomly created from a pool of several thousand different appearances and personalities, and even they could be capture targets. The insane degree of freedom had induced many an exasperated laugh from the players. The strangest thing about this series was that despite all the development cost, there had been no advertisement at all. The developer had also refused any and all reporters from game magazines or otherwise, the series became legendary on the internet as mimetic games that normal people would never know about, and now, the middle school girls who knew about the games had been summoned into exactly that world, just like how it had gone in the fictional story, they did notice that there were 17 people summoned, different from the 16 in the game, but their excitement had quickly overpowered their vague puzzlement, and they soon forgot about it. There were five main capture targets, plus extras. The age mentioned was the age they were at during the current school year. Yuri de von Argri, 19 years old. The Crown Prince of Argri Kingdom. Joel de von Argri, 15 years old. The Second Prince of Argri Kingdom. Andy de Mercia, 24 years old. Son of a Marquis, Commanding Officer of the Imperial Knights. Yoanda de Michel, 14 years old. Son of a Marquis. Fourth year student of the Magic Academy. Eric Marsaw. 27 years old, a baronet, a teacher at the Magic Academy. The extras were non-player characters that the player could talk to. Serving as the villains were three noble girls, plus extras. Emilia de von Argri, 13 years old, the first princess of Argri Kingdom. Camilla Dries, 20 years old, daughter of a duke, guest lecturer at the Magic Academy. Sharon de Michel, 15 years old daughter of a Marquis. Other antagonists included some other player characters. No matter who the player's target was, the villain girls would always be heavily involved, making trouble for the player. As there was no precise route to follow, the players hated these villain girls. The students who knew of this game world began to think. Within one year, they had to find a partner and capture them. But in case there was another player character beside them, then there was a risk that this other PC would be chasing after the same target as them, or making trouble for them. That meant they must not let anyone else know that they were a PC. Information was the most powerful weapon here, and by hiding what they knew, they would also be keeping the other PCs in check. Among the female students, the girl named Kamishiro had offered herself as a partner candidate to Sharon, one of the villainesses. They suspected her to be a player character too, but to confirm it would require them to reveal their own knowledge. It was risky, as they hid behind their smiles and their nervousness. The girls quietly sharpened their fangs. They were ready to put all they had into this, to hold nothing back. So began a deadly game of romance. 3. Skills it's morning, 
The ground is dappled with spots of sunlight weaving through the leaves, and I hear the chirping of unfamiliar birds. I iron my lady's uniform, carefully brushing off errant specks of dust from the fabric, and I hang it outside the closet. The pot full of water I placed on the stove, which uses magic stones as fuel, is beginning to boil now. As I listen to the bubbling water, I take out the magic stone from the magitech iron and use the leftover heat to iron the newspaper ink in place. Paper technology in this world has been developed and popularized enough to be used to make a newspaper, albeit the quality still leaves quite a lot to be desired. The paper I have in my hand is just a thin gossip rag for nobility, but my lady is a noble. She'll need it. Next, I slice off a few pieces from a hunk of salted pig carcass and drop them onto a heated frying pan. As the fat begins to ooze out of the slices of dead meat, I crack open the shell of some unborn creature to drop a viscous glob full of protein into the pan. To finish, I take a lump of kneaded and baked carbohydrate and lightly toast it in the oven. Then place everything onto white tableware while I wait for the brown rotten leaves to release their color into the hot water. MMM, my, it looks like the smell of burning dead flesh has woken Lady Sharon. As my lady crawls out of bed, I set the glob of fat-covered protein and the lump of carbohydrate onto a serving cart and push it in front of her. Good morning, Lady Sharon. How are you feeling? Mwa. Morning. My lady greets me with her adorable voice as she rises from the bed, her nose twitching and her eyes still bleary. She looks toward the window for a few moments. Then she jolts, doing a double take at me. Eh? Wa. H. How are you here? It seems my lady has finally become aware of reality. Of course, that is because I am your maid, Lady Sharon. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. No, that's not what I'm asking. My lady retorts with so much energy I am sure she'd have a bright future as a comedian. Oh, but she hasn't needed to worry. I know what she means. Yes, the window over there. E -e -e -e. This is the third floor. Was my original plan, but I didn't think I could enter without breaking the lock. So I asked the dorm mother to lend me the key. This magic academy is a boarding school. Lady Sharon is a daughter of a marquis, which makes her high nobility. It's why she has a private room on the third and highest floor. While the female dorm has a dining hall and a large public bath. This room also has its own bathtub, toilet, kitchenette, and basically every other things one needs to live. It's perfect for my lady, considering how withdrawn she is from now on. She'll never have to eat alone again. Did you just think something weird? I would never. I instantly reply without showing a hint of guilt. My lady believes me, it seems. Um. So, you. Lady Sharon speaks, sounding hesitant. Then she opens her mouth again, this time seeming more confident. Letty. Yes, Lady Sharon. My lady's finally called me by name. I release 100% of my aura in a beaming smile as I reply, and my lady shows a hint of redness on her cheeks and ears. Why yeah, she says, looking away from me in embarrassment. She sits back down on the edge of the bed, her negligee clad body in full view of me, completely defenseless. It seems the shock has completely erased what I said yesterday from her mind, about letting me touch her chest. I smirk, just as planned. Which reminds me, Letty. Are you sure coming to my place was a good idea? I thought His Highness Joel had said that the partner explanation was moved to today instead. That's right. That lout was the one to have butted in between me and my lady before I could swear my oath of loyalty to her. He was the one to have kicked me into a guest room and forced me to stay there as he spoke some drivel about allowing the others a chance to introduce themselves and deciding a partner after the orientation. Us summoned students did get some nights following us around in the shadow as bodyguards slash watchers. However, I am a maid, I wouldn't be stopped by such trivialities. In my wish to serve you, I have snuck out to come here first thing in the morning. I am Lady Sharon's maid, after all. I I see, my lady answers, trying and utterly failing to sound nonchalant, her fingers twirling in embarrassment. My lady does look the type to have few friends, after all. Gurgle, ape. Oh, yes. I have taken the liberty to make breakfast from the ingredients in the kitchen. I am not aware of my lady's taste, so please forgive me if my lady finds it too simple. I pretend to not have heard the sounds of her stomach. Instead, I take off the cover of the serving cart and set the dishes. Wah! She says, her eyes glittering. Bacon and eggs, a croissant. There's even black tea and the newspaper. 
Did you do all this, Letty? Yes, my lady. Right, that's the name of the stuff. I don't exactly eat, so I only remember them as rotten leaves or dead flesh. I asked the dining hall to share with me some of their freshly baked croissants. I made the rest with the ingredients in the kitchen, although the tea was something I got from the dorm mother, it came from her secret stash, she said. The dorm mother? But she's so strict. The dorm mother is a woman in her forties who's very intense in her speech. But I was very sincere in my request, and so she was happy to give me the tea and the key. So good, my lady gives her praise after she has had a taste. It's such a simple meal, and she's devouring it. How has she been eating all this time? I knew it, she has no friends. What did you just say? Hearing my whisper, Lady Sharon gives a piercing gaze toward me with her eyebrows raised. My, it seems I lost control of my mouth again. I'll have to fool her somehow. Oh no, my lady, it isn't what you think. I was just thinking that not wearing underwear when you sleep is also a cause of sagging. And that right now your sleepwear is making two little tents. Oh if. W what are you saying? Lady Sharon blushes crimson as she throws her slipper at my face, interrupting me. Looks like I've succeeded in distracting her. All's well that ends well. After the meal, I'm now helping my lady to dress herself. Lady Sharon looks at me in puzzlement. By the way, Letty. Yes, what is it? Despite her former fluster at my sexual harassment I mean, my words of caution. Once it was time to change, she didn't even balk at showing me her hefty melons. Nobles are such strange people. Where did you get that outfit? Looks like Lady Sharon is curious about the high quality made uniform I've been wearing since morning. I may be the second son of a count, but my uncle has promised me a piece of his territory. It's now the morning class hours of the Magic Academy. Instead of teaching, the school is using the time for orientation wherein the summoner students would introduce themselves to us partner candidates. All of us are right in the middle of our budding years of puberty, when we begin to take notice of the other sex. Boys are looking at girls and girls at boys. Their gaze is passionate upon finding someone they like. L listen up, people, I, I am the first daughter of a Marquis. I wonder if Lady Sharon's nervous. She's being very high-handed in both attitude and gestures yet still stealing glances at me all the while. And so before I know it, I was already giving her a standing ovation and shouting bravo, which made me the target of a lot of glares, so I'm forced to, very reluctantly, I must add, stop myself. I've heard you introducing yourself as Flurity. Be my partner, Cal, the one who got scolded yesterday by the knight that was his brother, declares, calling me by name and staring at me quite intensely. A hushed commotion instantly starts up among the nobles, while some of the love-struck girls in my class sigh dreamily. I suppose some people do like the high and mighty type, but someone with no interest would just find him really annoying. Which is why I just smile at Carl and give him a thumbs down. The nobles just tilt their head in confusion at the gesture, while several in my middle school class cough as they fail to completely contain their amusement. Only Eric Massar, one of the instructors of the academy, seems to have realized what I meant. He hastily changes the subject. W well, let's leave the talking for later no need to choose right away. We should see what skill everyone who were summoned this time have first. The human summoned into this world, in other words, people from Earth, would receive powerful magic upon the summoning. It happens because people from Earth don't have magic. What? You don't understand? Goodness. Fine then, I shall elaborate. This world is filled with mana. There's mana in the air, in the water, even in the Earth. The people of this world breathe the air drink the water, and eat the food grown from the soil, subsequently increasing the magic power they have in their body. Children born from people with strong magic would have more magic from the start. Countries were founded by the really powerful people with strong magic, which was how the noble caste was created. Mana is the source of magic power and at the same time, a kind of nutrient. Increased magic power also leads to increased physical strength, allowing one to learn the skills to fight against monsters. But Earth has no mana. Or to be more precise, Earth now barely has any mana left, which resulted in the people no longer possessing magic power. All life is supposed to possess magic power, yet the creatures of Earth have survived for over a thousand years without any. Imagine people used to living on high-altitude regions with little oxygen who were then sent to lower ground, 
The humans of Earth would then begin to rapidly absorb mana like a sponge in water and turn into what were practically superhumans. The end. Explanation done. Oh yes, we were talking about skills, weren't we? Of course I remember. Creatures with magic on this world are affected by how they spend their time, their preferences, and in turn they would gain special abilities, which are, in fact, a kind of natural magic, that are called skills. People summoned from Earth will be gaining skills when their minds are already mature, which apparently often results in them gaining useful skills. And to help people understand their power more easily, a magic tool to read and display one's own skills as words has been developed. Apparently that's what we'll be using today. This world is very complete, isn't it? Very convenient. Now, please take turns and place your hand on this crystal ball. Instructor Eric says. The middle school students begin to form a line, their expressions showing both nervousness and excitement. Then I'll go first. Looks like we're starting from s. The boy stands in front of the ball, somewhat tense from being the first, and his finger touches the surface. Bright letters begin to appear inside the ball. Light magic aptitude, holy aura, divine blessing, martial arts talent, foreign tongue. A chorus of oohs and us comes from the people of the academy. Is this good? It is. A human always get from two to four skills, but I rarely see someone with so many useful skills. The instructor continues into an explanation, which I'll summarize as follows. Normal people mostly have skills related to their livelihood, such as, cooking aptitude, or, farming aptitude, or, increased walking speed. People with magical or combat skills are rare. After s other students are also shown to possess many practical and fantastic skills such as, healing magic aptitude, automatic mapping, regeneration, and etc. How? One of the two students that act as the leaders of the boys with the other beings, his best friend, is also notable for his skills, flight, increased physical speed, wind magic aptitude, eagle eye, foreign tongue. The noble's eyes lit up in sheer excitement. So the last person would be, instructor Eric says, prompting everyone to look at me, standing alone and quite obviously given a wide berth. My, how strange. I don't recall doing anything particularly eye-catching. I leisurely walk forward. Instructor Eric looks as though he wants to say something. What might be on your mind, sir? Um, well, I was wondering why you're dressed in clothes of a servant's. That is because I am a maid. My answer didn't please him. It seems I pay him no mind. I walk up and nonchalantly brush a finger on the crystal ball. The shining words appear. The amazing maid. Nobody says anything for quite some time. I think I know what this is. It must be that thing where people like to tack amazing, incredible, or fantastic onto their titles all the time, right? I smile, completely satisfied by the results of my skill identification. The room ceases its silence as a commotion breaks out. Amazing? Could it be a composite skill? Am I the only one who notices she has the word there in her skill? Hold on. How in the worlds is she understanding the language without foreign tongue? Did she make that expensive looking servant uniform by herself too? Answering the academy people's confusion, I pinch the sides of my uniform skirt that extends all the way to my ankles, and I smile a telling smile that gives nothing away. That would be a maiden's secret. I continue to be enigmatic until the end of the orientation. Everyone leaves for their own dorm rooms, looking weirdly tired. I wonder why? A moment please, Sir Eric Marsaw, what will become of my and Lady Sharon's partner contract? Oh, yes, there's that too. Instructor Eric replies, making a bit of a face. Lady Sharon's shoulders twitch. She's been trying to listen to us. Ah, but before that, I just want to tell you that I'm only of low nobility. You can just call me teacher or instructor. Understood, instructor. So about the contract with Miss Sharon? Well, how about this? Somebody might make a fuss if we make it official right away. So let's go with a tentative contract. You two will be provisional partners for the moment. I don't think they'll complain at that. Thank you very much. It's rather galling that we can't become partners straight away. But at least this way I won't need to sneak around to stay with Lady Sharon. My lady continues to act nonchalant. Though I can see her skipping a little bit on our way back to the dorm. So cute. But just before I could follow, Instructor Eric calls. Please wait. What is it? 
Instructor, I reply, not bothering to hide my feigned displeasure at the interference to my time with Lady Sharon. Instructor Eric shrinks back a bit but continues to speak, his voice almost a whisper. Be careful. Your strange skill has both turned away some people and attracted the attention of some others. Watch for those around Miss Sharon. I understand, Instructor. I leave for Lady Sharon. Several shadows follow behind me, silently, avoiding attention as they come closer and closer. Four, Malice. Two men moved, slinking through the crowd of people as they approached their target. Excuse me, miss, can we talk with you for a moment? In a dark alleyway with no sign of anyone else, one of the men called at her. Can't get any more suspicious than this, he wryly thought to himself. But the girl, formerly a denizen of a peaceful world, showed neither caution nor surprise as she turned around. How may I help you, misters? She said, tilting her head. A blank look on her face. The men unwittingly gulped. They had heard that she was one year younger than the students who had done the summoning, being barely fourteen years of age, but the girl in front of them was displaying a kind of exotic that belied her years, that had perhaps come from her mixed heritage. No wonder the young master was obsessed with her. They thought the two men had taken a request from a count whose child had been one of the student summoners. They had been asked to persuade the girl to become the count's son's partner. The results of the summoning this time had been rather unusual, human youngsters. Furthermore, they were extremely close in age to the academy students, and all of them were quite good-looking. Though the degree of interest might vary, both the male and female students had been exuberant for the newcomers, but the sweet, still somewhat childishly cute girls among the summoned hadn't attracted the Count's son's attention. He was instead infatuated by the beauty of this particular girl lonely, and rather than trying to win her over by himself, he had called for his further's help. My name is Christo, and I work for a noble's house. My lord was deeply impressed by your beauty, and so I'm here on his behalf to extend to you a cordial invitation to a dinner meal. My, is that so? The girl wearing a maid uniform gave a faint smile that reached her wine-red eyes, but I am my lady's maid and my duty is to take care of her. I shall have to decline. No no no, please wait for a minute. You're still not an official partner yet, right? You shouldn't be. Why not allow my lord a chance? My apologies. The maid girl refused the offer without a second thought. Krista was flustered. From what he'd heard, this girl had become the partner candidate of a Marquis daughter. However, the noble girl had been the daughter of the previous wife who was a lowborn and the child was shunned by her family. Subsequently, she had not received a complete education in her younger years, which had resulted in her current lack of skill in magic control and low grades. The Count had said with absolute certainty that after the orientation today, the maid girl would have known that the other students were much better choices and thus, would be swayed by the dinner invitation. Barely any time had passed since the summoning. What had happened between the Marquis' daughter and this girl? Why was she so fixated on her? I suppose that's it, then, Christo said after a few moments of silence. Thank you for your understanding, but you know. I don't plan on returning empty-handed. Christo himself was the third son of a baronet house that hadn't been particularly wealthy. Upon becoming an adult, he was kicked out of the house without any support. Until then, as poor as his family had been, Christo had still been living as a noble. He couldn't bear to work under commoners, it hadn't taken long for him to fall in with the criminal crowd, yet even in the underworld, Christo still found himself without any particularly notable achievements. And then, from a contact he had among the nobles, a job dropped into his lap. A job that required him to leverage his status of being an alumnus of the Magic Academy in order to infiltrate the place. He couldn't afford to fail this job. The Count had told him to use as light a touch as he could, but the man had lived among criminals for far too long. He turned to the plan reserved only for when negotiations had broken down. That Marquis daughter? I heard she'd gone downtown by herself to buy some supplies to prepare for you, my lady. The girl's lidded eyes opened a fraction wider. The miss is being quite careless, I must say. Shops for nobles would be much safer, though considering her reputation, they wouldn't be an option. No. She could only go to the shopping district that serves commoners. And well, that means. Midway through his gloating, Christo abruptly stopped himself. The girl in front of him was still smiling as she always did. Yet Christo felt a faint chill running down his spine, his foot taking an unwitting step back. Get her, 
Christo gave the signal to his partner. Something was wrong, he felt, even if he didn't know what it was. As it was, he might as well kidnap both this girl and the Marquis' daughter, then let the Count sort them out. So went his simplistic thoughts. The other man moved toward the girl, quickly and without hesitation, his experience in criminal work apparent. But the man suddenly stopped, a croaking noise slipping from his mouth. What's going on? Christo said, but no reply was forthcoming. The other man was rooted to the spot as though paralyzed. The girl poked her head halfway out from behind him, her smile unchanging, her dark gaze pointing at Christo. He gulped, reeling backward from the fear that struck his very instincts, but he was stopped by a wall that hadn't been there before. W what? The wall behind him looked as though it was made from pure, concentrated darkness. He struck it, to no avail. The same solid blackness had extended to completely surround him. Where are you going? A voice came from behind him. He shrieked. He turned around from pounding the wall. He saw the girl standing there with her perpetual smile, and near her was his partner. But the man's arms and legs were twisted, his limbs jerking every which way as though he was a marionette being made to follow an eerie dance. Christo squeaked, his legs giving out. The girl walked closer closer, and her hand brushed against him, his gaze was stolen by the sight of her lustrous lips as they slowly parted to reveal a gaping maw of darkness, inside, he saw an innumerable swarm of something crawling, skittering, he screamed in mad terror, still wearing her uniform, Sharon arrived at the shopping district that mainly catered to commoners, excuse me, I'd like that cup and that toothbrush, there you go, thanks for your business, Lassie. People nearby were thinking her to be a girl from a well-to-do family as they looked at her Magic Academy school uniform, but none thought her to be an actual noble. She was being much too shy. Any other day, and Sharon might have been more arrogant, perhaps too arrogant, even, as she acted the part of a proud noble, but as elated as she was, her status was the furthest thing from her mind at the moment. The girl called Floretti summoned from another world had decided to become her partner. Even if things weren't official yet, she had chosen Sharon. Her father was much too meek. Her stepmother didn't want her. Her little brother was rebelling against her. The maids and butlers scorned her. Ever since her mother was gone, Sharon couldn't recall herself having a meal with the family even once. It was why Sharon had clung to her status as the daughter of a Marquis house more than she needed to. Why she had begun acting as proud as she had. Her decision had borne fruit, perhaps, considering that she had become the third fiancé candidate for the second prince. Yet it had also resulted in her becoming the target of jealousy from the other girls, and there was no one she could call as friends. Then Fluriti appeared. Admittedly, Sharon felt like the girl was indecipherable, at times. But on the other hand, the maids at her home didn't even consider her as anything more than being her maid. The possibility that Fluriti could be her friend was what had set her heart dancing. Buying the things needed for your partner is a noble's duty too, right? MMM, it is, yes. Sharon mumbled to herself. The young lady continued with her shopping, her mood still buoyant. Then she realized she hadn't bought clothes for Fluriti, and she took a look at her diminished wallet. Moving out of her home and into the dorm had relieved her of a lot of stress, but due to her stepmother, her allowance had also been reduced to the bare minimum. The dorm's dining hall did serve food, although it was closer to being a commoner's fare. When nobles came to the dining hall, it was only to make conversation with commoner students. No noble would ever eat in the dining hall alone by themselves when they had servants to make food for them. Considering her future expenses, Sharon decided to leave enough for food. For the rest, she would have to bow her head to her little brother from another mother, Yuan, and ask him to lend her some money. Even as uncomfortable as she was of the idea, she had no other choice. The family sent Yuan as much money as he wanted. He even brought along a personal maid. Yuan would likely lend her the money if she bowed to him, but she was certain that he and his maid would be making snide remarks and unpleasant comments towards Sharon for quite a long time afterward. Just thinking about it was already making her feel depressed. Hey, young lady. We've just opened up a new clothing store. Wanna take a look? Hey, Me? Sharon turned to look in the voice's direction. She saw a woman in her late twenties, wearing some very revealing clothes. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you. So setting up the store's all fine and good. But our place is a bit far away from the main streets, which is why I'm here advertising. Do us a favor, please. Just come take a look. Well, maybe just a look is fine, 
Sharon thought, though she would be far too embarrassed to wear something that showed as much as what the woman had on. Ah, I see. Don't worry, we sell decent clothes too. Besides, the woman moved to whisper in Sharon's ear, sounding sickly sweet. We also have some classy stuff that would still get the gentleman's horses running, if you know what I'm saying, as lovely as you are. Young lady, surely you have one or two guys you're pining after, right? Her words brought to Sharon's mind the faces of the boys at the summoning, and her own instantly felt hot, and even if that's not the case, our stuff's cheap, too. Just a look, okay? I guess just a look won't hurt. Well, clothes to meet with boys aside, the store might have something on the cheaper side that would look nice on Furity, Sharon thought, without a hint of wariness. The woman guided her into a dark alleyway. The distinctively rotten smell of back alleys assaulted Sharon's nose. She gulped down her nausea, her hand reflexively shooting up to cover her mouth. Sorry about that, the woman chuckled, should have picked another path. Anyway, the store's over there. We'll get through quick. Why yes. The woman was practically pushing Sharon in. Deeper and deeper they went, walking through gloomy alleys that didn't even have a single soul, much less a shop. Sharon's apprehension mounted with every step. After a while, Sharon was deep enough in that she no longer heard the hustle and bustle of the main street. Some time after she walked past a shadowy side path that looked just like any other, five men appeared from within. They began to follow behind her. Is that the noble girl? How about that? She's quite the bombshell. Can't wait to have a taste. Dude, she's for selling to another noble. Damaged merchandise won't sell as much. Come on. It's just gonna be a strip show. That's okay, right? The fourth man said, looking behind him for agreement. The fifth man wasn't there. H. Hey, where'd he go? What's wrong? Did somebody leave? Who was it? The third man turned toward his colleague walking by his side. There was nobody there. W. What? Where'd he go? He's gone too. What the hell? What the fuck is going on? Their colleagues were vanishing into thin air one by one, and nobody knew when it had happened. The alley was getting darker and darker as through they were stepping into some other dimension. The remaining men huddled together in fear. H. Hey, look at that. One said, his voice quivering. The rest looked in the direction he was pointing to, into the depths of the alleyway that had abruptly turned midnight dark. They could see the silhouettes of four people walking toward them in lurching, twitchy steps, like puppets on strings. See Christo? Somebody let loose a raspy whisper as they noticed their missing teammates, as well as another familiar face. Christo had been the one to have hired them for this job. And right now he was supposed to be negotiating with the main target. But was he really Christo? Were they really their teammates? Their skins were the color of dead men, and there was no life to be seen in their eyes. They looked like zombies. Zombies were monsters created when low-ranked spirits possessed corpses that had accumulated enough of the ground's mana. But that sort of low-ranked spirits should have been completely eradicated from the city, and besides, zombies didn't even have enough intelligence to speak in the first place. And yet right now, the remaining men were hearing groaning voices of anguish coming from Christo and their shambling teammates. Help. Who.rts. Kill.me. Faced with a sight that wouldn't be out of place in the most hellish of nightmares. The remaining men were paralyzed with terror. And then from behind the four shambling dolls, a girl appeared, like a beautiful flower to slice apart the darkness. Why all clad in a high quality set of maid uniform, the girl pinched the hem of her skirt to give a bow as elegant as any noble lady her lips twitching in a faint smile. Then she violently plunged her arm into Christo's back, her hand wetly going through his organs to grab his jaw from the inside to move it like a ventriloquist's puppet. From his lips came the voice of a young girl. Greetings. My name is Furity. A warm wetness spread in the pants of the three remaining men as their knees buckled, their expressions nothing but despair. They had thought the earlier sight of their shambling teammates had been the most terrible moment of their lives. They were wrong. D. Demon. Hearing the whisper, the lovely girl's lips stretched her ears in a grin. Five, friends. A. N. A recollection chapter. The very first time I woke up, it was to a lifeless world of darkness. I knew nothing. Not where I was, nor what I was. I only had a vague feeling that I used to be living in some other world, somewhere not here. Yet as ignorant as I was, my mind still possessed a strange sort of knowledge enough so that I could recognize my current form as something like a mass of slime. A part of me was finding the whole thing unnatural, 
uncomfortable. Another part much more instinctive was driving me to catch these strange bug-like things and eat them. Every time I crushed a bug, I felt sweetness, a physical satisfaction, but it was also accompanied with a kind of forlorn homesickness. I stopped eating the bugs to instead spend all my time chasing thoughts that never go anywhere. My body shouted at me, telling me it was hungry, but my mind was filled with nothing but sadness and sorrow, robbing me of all will to live. I had enemies, well, not quite exactly enemies, to be accurate. Among them were slimes like me, as well as some sort of things that looked like clouds of mist. They were probably of the same species as me, and they were trying to eat me. I wasn't scared. I also didn't want to be eaten by them, I ran a, I mean, I strategically retreated, forcing my deteriorating body to carry me away, but they were faster as they were slowly but surely catching up to me, something resembling an incredibly small magic circle suddenly appeared in front of me in a burst of shining light, and it sucked me in. It was a tiny, tiny summoning circle, and it was unstable, if I hadn't been so weakened, so starved, I probably wouldn't have passed through it. I arrived somewhere bright, thinking that my hunters wouldn't be able to catch up with me now. I jiggled in relief. Yes, I did it. This might be the first time since I was born that I heard words of meaning, I thought. As I gradually got used to the light, I came to realize that I was in a room built out of stone. Standing in the middle of the room and looking at me was a small girl. She was a cute thing of about five years old, with silver hair and violet eyes. Her dress itself was finely made. Though I could see fraying threads here and there, her gaze was fixed on me with evident joy. Then I felt a connection opening up between us, a conduit through which poured into me her loneliness and her magic. It filled my weakened body with strength. As small as she was, I was still smaller. She beamed at me, reaching out a hand to brush against me so gingerly, as though afraid that any more force would pop me like a balloon. Hey, will you be? The very moment she finished her words. The magic circle once more sucked me in. I took a look around to see that I was already back in that world of darkness. The magic circle must have been incomplete, I thought. Not enough magic power. Memories of the girl passed through my mind, accompanied by a faint sadness. Yet this was no time for sentimentality. My fellow creatures of darkness had been lying in wait for my return, and they were now approaching me. But I was no longer the same. The slimes attacked. I slipped through them, using the power I'd regain thanks to the girl's supply of magic to eliminate my enemies. Ooh, tasty. After that, well, I kinda went a bit out of control. I still didn't know what sort of creature I was, but my instincts seemed to know how to fight, so I listened to it. I killed and consumed more of those things that looked like me. I had thought the cannibalism would have bothered me at least a little bit, yet I felt nothing at all. I wondered why. I was on a roll. I kept eating, eating, and my body began to feel heavier. Hold on. Was I getting fat? I got stronger but also slower, so my hunting speed didn't improve. If only I was faster. If only I was more nimble. If only I had a longer reach. If only I had more limbs, so that I could hunt more of my prey. Splat. My black claws tore apart a small simian thing. In the end. I turned into some sort of spindly creature with super long legs that looked a lot like a golden orb weaver spider. Only pure lack in color. Why the heck did this happen? I asked for it. That's why. With the transformation, I got even cockier. The small slimes and clouds of mist no longer satisfied me, and I began to hunt the small monkeys. The little guys were quite powerful. With my new ability to spin thread like a real spider, however, I grew strong enough to deal with five of them at once without breaking a sweat. Some more time passed since then. I might have gotten a bit too arrogant. I found a monkey somewhat stronger than the rest, with a slightly different fur color. I killed him after a difficult fight and surprise, surprise, he dropped something that looked like some dried seaweed upon his death. It's like a video game. Then a while after, all the monkeys and slimes near me vanished. Had I gotten powerful enough for them to avoid me? I thought, full of myself. I was wrong. Apparently I was smarter than them, but also with a weaker set of survival instincts. Ape. I only realized its existence after it got much too close. Something terrible was coming, something impossibly brutal. An oppressively enormous presence was heading in my direction. The monkeys and slimes had ran away because of the arrival of this thing. At least give me a warning. Weren't you my neighbors? 
What arrived was a horror in the shape of a human wearing a maid uniform. I knew, just from a glance, that both running and fighting would be meaningless to the giant in front of me. I was but an ant no, a microbe. I couldn't even look at her. I immediately dropped down, my face scraping the ground. I thought I felt a flicker of something changing in the aura of the horror before me as she saw my perpendicular prostration. The innumerable strands of hair on her head stretched out toward me. Ah, they weren't hair. They were gold-colored snakes. The swarm of snakes stared at me, watching me. The horror looked at the nest I built out of my threads. And she decided to get me as takeaway. Somebody help me. In the end, I wasn't eaten. Apparently the monkey with the weird coloring that I killed had been a subordinate of the horror I mean, Miss Horror, and since I killed it, now I had to work for her as a replacement. I was hired, to be paid with an exceptional salary of one kilogram of dried seaweed a day, and my job was to make clothes, that were going to be worn by women, it seemed, with my threads. Why seaweed? What? No, I didn't call you a horror. <laughs> I have to call you the maid chief. R. Yes, understood. Once she found out I could speak, I was, for some reason, provided with a maid uniform and repositioned into the maid squad as a newcomer. A spider wearing a maid uniform. Surreal, right? Who made this? The maid chief herself. Surprisingly, and it was handmade too at that. Thus began my maid life. Proper language and manners were beaten into me. Memories of what was probably a past life combined with the fact that I picked things up decently quickly had helped me to, in time, climb up the ranks to become the maid chief's assistant. The existence of a maid implied the existence of a master that she would serve, then I really had to wonder how ridiculous the horror of him, I mean, the maid chief's master had to be, if they managed to make her into their servant. But I was just an insignificant spider. I would never have the chance to meet that sort of deity in my whole lifetime. It's actually relaxing in a way, ha ha ha. What? The Lord wanted to meet me? Seriously? From what I'd heard, the underthings that I'd been making days and nights from my threads, a material that I could proudly say to be even better than silk, had been presented to the Lord, and that they'd caught her attention, as unbelievable as it was. Darn it. I should have cut some corners, not like I actually would, though, the maid chief would chastise me, severely. So now, I was being dragged toward the Lord's place for an audience. The Lord was, um, how do I say this, she were giving off so much golden light I couldn't even see what she looked like, anyway, before her overwhelming presence and divinity, I unconsciously and instantly did a perpendicular prostration, again, by the way, a perpendicular prostration was when you touched the ground with your head while your butt pointed up in the air, which made your lower body perpendicular to the ground, seeing my strange posture, the masked maid beside the Lord cackled as she held her stomach. Life was such a strange thing. You never knew what tomorrow might bring. I wasn't sure what had endeared me so to the Lord, but she had decided to grant me a name herself. Fority, the Lord was the only one who could bestow names to creatures like us. With a name, my power was stabilized and dramatically strengthened. With my power and my abilities, I was granted a thousand subordinate maids in the duty to eliminate the enemies of the Lord. Flority, the maid lieutenant general. What did being a maid have to do with this? A question came to my mind and was out of my mouth before I could think about it. Why lieutenant general? Then the Lord spoke as though I'd asked something obvious. Flority's supposed to be a lieutenant general, right? It seemed like my name had a history behind it. Anyway, while I still had no idea what it meant. I was on the fast track to success. Yet although my life seemed to be smooth sailing, I could see dark clouds waiting for me on the horizon. My power had been growing unimpeded until now, but it was plateauing these days. But well, I still had enough strength to deal with most enemies I encountered anyway, excepting the maid chief and the lord's aides. I was considered one of the more powerful among my colleagues, so I wasn't really that worried. I continued to live my life as carefree as ever. Then one day, I was called to meet the Lord once more. Was I going to get my pay docked? It seemed the Lord knew the reason why my power hadn't been growing. To summarize what she said, it was because I hadn't completed my first contract. My contract? The moment I heard the words, I was reminded of the adorable girl. I still hadn't fulfilled my promise with her. Ever since that day, for every single moment of my life, she had been occupying some corner of my mind, but knowing that I couldn't enter that world by my own power, 
a part of me had already given up. I could say that I was busy living for myself, that I hadn't the spare time. But it would just be an excuse. The girl had given me the power to live. After all, I want to see her again. I thought idly, I really do. I wished that I could meet her, could become her strength. I wanted to fulfill our promise. I wanted to meet her again, and this time around, Illy. And right at that moment, I thought I felt the Lord smirking. Oh no. What a gaff of all the things I could have done. I had made a wish in front of someone who might as well be a goddess. I might not have said it out loud, but a wish had still been a wish. Eek. A golden magic circle abruptly appeared on the ground below me. The Lord spoke as I panicked. She said that the bond between me and the girl was a string that connected us, that pulled us together even through time and space. That would allow us to meet once more. Then I returned to the body I once had in my past life, and I met my lady once more. That's it, everyone. The flashback is over, my? It seems the remaining people had gone ahead and passed away while I was busy with my lengthy reminiscence. I had planned to teach them a bit of a lesson, but when I heard of their intentions toward Lady Sharon, well, I just... accidentally. At any rate, I order the meat still under my control to deal with the expired meat, and I head for my lady. TSK, the fuck are they doing? Comparing dick sizes? Fine. I'll do it myself. W what are you doing? What about the store? Ha. Huh. Well aren't you just precious? Don't be so scared. Just listen to what you're told and you won't be hurt. Why you He hey. That's right. I'm going to kidnap you and sell you to those dirty old noblemen. Do what they want you to and you just might live even better than you are now, you know? N no. Somebody. Nobody's coming. You only have yourself to blame. Little girl. Weren't you taught to not follow strangers? Hey, come now. Don't run. No. No, someone. Letty. Yes. My lady. What is your order? I speak. Eh? My fearful lady says, looking like a bit of an idiot or hum, looking rather flabbergasted, her cute little puppy dog eyes opening widely. Letty. Yes, my lady. Fruity is here. W what about that woman? She was blocking my way so I relocated her. My lady. Blocking your way? Why are you here? I am here because my lady called for me. I speak as gently as I can, enveloping her still shivering hand with both of my own as I try to reassure her. My lady squeezes back tightly and presses her face to my shoulder. Thank you. She whispers. Her voice muted and quavering. After we came back to the dorm, I made dinner for my lady. Then helped change her clothes and bathe her. By then, it was near lights out in the dorm. I lay my lady down on the clean and carefully made bed. I turn off all the lights except for the lantern I'm holding. My lady speaks, sounding somewhat forlorn. Good night, Letty. I wish you a good night, Lady Sharon. Despite her unease, it doesn't take long for her breathing to slow down. She must have been tired. But even when asleep, her hand is still looking for something to grip, to give her comfort. I silently walk toward her and kneel down by the side of her bed. I take her hand in mine. Her breathing calms down, from her small lips comes barely a whisper, Letty, yes, asleep, my lady looks so much younger, I look at her face and remember, you had been just a child back then, you had called for me when I was still weak, and you had given me the strength to live, that day, Lady Sharon had spoken to me, hey, will you be my friend, please, as the light of the moon slips through the curtain gaps and falls on the two of us, I gently stroke her hair and give her a smile. Yes, Lady Sharon. I am here. I will always be here. 6. Looming Threat. For tonight's dinner, we have fish tartar garnished with herbs as the starter. The main dish is roasted meat served with fruit wine and black currant sauce. After that, we have a salad made from wild forest pickings. I was gifted some choice figs from the dining hall, so I thought to make compote for dessert. In her room at the girls' dorm of the Magic Academy, my lady is sitting at a table full of food I've made and served. She stiffly nods with cutleries in hand. Ah, yes. It has been three days since I became my lady's provisional partner. She was quite shy at first, but she has since then gotten used to my presence. I've also moved out of the guest room and into the servants' room the one connected to my lady's own. Ever since my lady allowed me to take care of her, I've been making use of all the knowledge and skills that the maid chief had taught me, especially when it comes to cooking for her. And since my lady seems to have been making her own food all this time, even as clumsy as she is, she has been looking very happy these days. Lady Sharon, is it not to your liking? 
No, not that. Letty's cooking is always the best, my lady says, jumping up from her chair. But then she immediately looks back toward the food, looking worried. Just. How much did you have to pay for all these? From what I've heard, the loaves at her home have been treating her rather coldly, and my lady was forced to watch her spending as a result. The noble children going to this school all have servants with them, courtesy of their families, yet my lady has nobody. No butlers, no maids, not even any cooks. While her esteemed younger brother only brought along a maid and a manservant. They also have the extravagant funds to get chefs from outside the school to make them food. Maybe I should pay them a visit, me? As foreigners summoned from another world, I and the rest of my class can eat at the school's dining hall for free, until we decide on a partner. We also receive clothing and other living supplies from the country, and they even give us three gold coins a month, as living allowance. A single gold coin comes to about 100,000 Japanese yen. That means we get 300,000 yen a month. Quite generous, I must say. Well, they did kidnap us through dimensions. I suppose it's the least they could do. At any rate, it means that since I'm still just a provisional partner, I can apply for the three gold coins allowance. But a while ago, when I was about to do that to get the money for our food and other supplies, my lady scolded me. I expect nothing less from Lady Sharon, I told her then. My lady is blessed with such integrity that rivals the size of your chest. Then she whacked me with her slipper. Anyway, back to the present. Yes, my lady, this meal costs almost nothing. She exclaims in open-mouthed puzzlement. How cute. There is a rather large forest to the west of the city, just a short walk away. It is where I have collected the wild ingredients and hunted the meat for this meal. The forest to the west. Wait, hold on. Isn't that the dark woods? My? My lady's face has gone pale. I wonder why. T that place is full of monsters. It's dangerous. Is that so, my lady? It would explain why the strange-looking giant caterpillars and centipedes had been hostile. I was fortunate that there had been so many to hunt. Eh? Then, you mean? My lady looks down on the meat she has been eating with unease. Indeed, my lady, the roast was made from the centipedes and the caterpillars. The tartare was made from fishmen. I made the salad by mincing the carnivorous plants. Of course, I have already done the cleaning of residual mana from the ingredients, so my lady has no need to worry. There is a lot of meat walking around the city on two legs, but even I know it's not fit to serve to my lady. I'm not so indiscriminate. By the way, my lady has been looking rather green ever since I told her about the perfectly good ingredients I got. She's holding a hand to her mouth. Erp, my lady? Goodness. Did the monster meat not agree with her constitution? I hurry toward her to rub her back, but she raises a slipper to slap at me the moment I get close. Her eyes wet and her brows scrunched up. The slipper is accompanied with an adorable squeak of effort. What a relief. She seems quite energetic. However, I can't just keep getting hit time after time like this. I let my lady strike whiff past me and strike a pose like a certain yellow jumpsuit clad man. I bounce on my feet, wiping a thumb on my lips even though they aren't even bleeding, and I wag my finger. My lady releases a fierce cry of outrage and charges at me with slippers in both hands. Our relationship building exercise lasts all the way until the next morning. I'm going to the dungeon, my lady says, after waking up from a nap from morning until noon. There are a few dark circles under her eyes, but she seems quite lively. There's no school today. This country is similar to Earth in that they also have seven days in a week, and that one day is set aside as a rest day. Understood, my lady. I shall wait for your return. I say, bowing respectfully. My lady's shoulders tremble. El Letty, are you not coming with me? She looks at me like an abandoned puppy. Although Lady Sharon is one year older than me, she is slightly shorter in height. That means that whenever she gets affectionate, she automatically makes this extremely unfair upturned eyes look. She doesn't even seem aware she's doing it. Would my presence be acceptable then? My lady, we're not going to class. It's fine. Come with me. Please, my lady asks, sounding almost like a child begging. Understood, my lady. I reply with a nod and a grin veering on being excessive. And so the two of us stand together to face a terrible threat looming upon us, a lack of food funds. Dungeons exist in this world. Not only that, they're even considered to be a crucial aspect of civilization. The dungeons of this world aren't ruins, 
labyrinths, or any sort of man-made structures. They're simply just a type of monster. From what I heard, their origin was a sort of hermit crab that had transformed into a monster. Upon their births, the monsters called dungeons would burrow into the ground, consuming the nutrients and minerals inside the earth to create an extremely sturdy cave system. The cave system would then release a slight amount of mana to attract other monsters, and in return the dungeon would live by absorbing the excess life force and magic power of the monsters that had come to live inside it. Dungeons themselves were rather benign monsters, all in all. Then things changed about a thousand years ago. The humans at the time had known that the exposed minerals and metals generated in the walls of dungeons were of extremely high purity, and they began to kill the monsters in the dungeon and mine the precious metals. This had brought changes to the dungeons themselves. As humans fought with monsters inside dungeons, their injuries and deaths would then release life force and magic power of high purity for the dungeon to absorb. The older a dungeon was, the larger it grew. Dungeons had evolved, in a manner of speaking. They had even acquired the ability to read the remnant memories of dead creatures inside them. And in time, they began to turn their shell into stone hallways as they looked upon the knowledge of humans, creating weapons and other pieces of equipment with forms and qualities that would appeal to humans. Dungeons no longer attracted only monsters. They had learned to attract humans. Dungeons used items, minerals, precious metals, and other such valuables to lure in humans, getting them to fight the monsters living inside their shells and harvesting life force and magic power. Humans went inside dungeons to gather not only valuable minerals and items, but also monster materials and even combat experience for their soldiers. And so it came to be that the humans of this world entered a relationship of mutual benefit with the dungeon's symbiosis. Here ended the exposition. Right now, my lady and I are heading for the eastern side of the city, where the third dungeon of the kingdom is. My lady isn't wearing her uniform today. She has on a cheap-looking set of leather armor instead. Geez, it's what the school gives me. I can't help it. Indeed, as financially challenged as we are, I understand that a new set of armor would be the height of luxuries. You're not wrong, but somehow I'm feeling really irritated right now. Oh no. I did not mean anything by that. Please believe this maid, my lady. Speaking of which, at first I thought the nobles here would be like the kind I often see in fiction. People who bring along a huge procession of guards and horse carriages whenever they go out in this world. However, it's not rare to see nobles coasting around town with just a single carriage and coachman to accompany them. Even people of high nobility do the same thing. I suppose it goes to show how safe this city is, the slums excepting. It seems it wasn't because my lady was exceptionally poor that she went alone to the commoner's shopping district. Letty, did you just think something weird? My lady, is it true what they say? that people with bigger breasts are worse at math. What has that got to do with anything? Geez, come on, look, we're here, it's the Explorer's Guild, distraction successful, it seems. By the way, readers, do you need me to explain about the Explorer's Guild too? Fine, the Explorer's Guild is a government department that oversees the dungeons, they also buys dungeon items and monster materials. As people entering dungeons can range from individuals to organized mining groups working for a business, supervision is of the utmost necessity. Lady Sharon, too, has done her registration back when she was a third year as a part of the school's curriculum. One may wonder why a noble such as my lady would risk herself so. The answer is that since the noble caste of this country were descended from powerful people of ages past, beside the typical responsibilities expected of them. They also have an obligation to dive into dungeons and bring back for the country items of qualities commensurate to their noble rank. My lady's own family, a Marquis house, has often been the target of ridicule from the other noble houses, the only exceptions being the rare times they manage to bring back rare items from the dungeon's lower floors. They've lost quite a bit of dignity, I hear. Serves them right. Listen up. Letty. Even if we encounter some unpleasant characters inside, remember, our safety is the most important. Yes? R. Yes. Understood. We're a group of two girls. Will some fun happenings be waiting inside for us, then? Like, hey hey hey, this ain't no place for spoiled little brats. Or maybe get over here and pour me a drink, girlies. No matter who or what may threaten us, I shall swear on my name of Flurity, the maid lieutenant general. 
that they will be reduced to atoms before they could befoul my lady with their touch. We enter the guild. Turns out the building isn't the kind that also doubles as a tavern, one that has drunkards lolling around all over the place. Instead, it looks like a modern city hall with its white plaster walls and smooth stone floor. Hold on, Letty, why do you look disappointed? I was thinking that the facility seems cleaner than I expected, my lady. At any rate, let's take a look at what's available. I hope there's a trading firm somewhere posting mass requests. Oh, Sharon. My lady's shoulders faintly tremble upon hearing the voice. She doesn't move, so I turn to look in her place and see three boys and three girls, all wearing very familiar attire. They gaze at us with varying expressions. Ah, I see. Unpleasant characters indeed. Hey. Fluity. Get away from that girl. Your place is next to me. The one to have called at me was Cal, that boy who made a fuss the other day. And the girls, no wonder they look familiar. The three girls wearing the uniforms of that middle school are exactly those classmates of mine who have pushed me down the cliff. Crap. It's Kamishiro. They whisper the moment they catch sight of me. Is this a group date? Quite poor taste they have, both the boys and girls. Well, the girls aside. Carl is still nominally my lady's friend from school at least, as her maid, I am required to maintain a certain level of respect, my apologies. I am Lady Sharon's maid at the moment. Why yes, that's right, L. Letty is my pea partner. My lady's operating system has finally rebooted, she fire back at Cal, sounding as imposing as a three-year-old with a speech impediment, ha, huh, please, it's not even official yet, come on. Fluity, stop staying with that idiot girl. She's so poor she can't even get anything better than those cheap leathery rags. Be my woman and I promise you, you'll live like a queen. Should I turn him into fertilizer? And he's even making advances to me. Despite the three girls still standing right next to him, does he not notice them glowering at both me and him? That's enough. Calm down, both of you. Again? The men of this world just have to be in the limelight all the time, it seems. So tiresome. So the newcomer is, surprise, his highness Joel. I didn't expect to meet the second prince of the country here, of all places. Does he have too much time on his hand? He has a long an entourage of several imperial knights, as I expected. He is royalty, after all, and he can't afford to go without bodyguards like nobles do, Cal. I see that several of the ladies are with you. You would do well not to attract any unwanted trouble. T.S.K. Carl, that attitude is unacceptable. Shut up, brother. This doesn't concern you. Andy, Cal, stop. I am telling you to calm down. Apparently that one Imperial Knight is here too. Honestly, they're all the same to me, Prince or not. How about you, Sharon? I understand you might have much to say. No, Your Highness. I have no objections. I see. His Highness Joel replies curtly, nodding to my lady and turning away to walk toward the guild's reception desk. Carl does a mock spit at my lady and leaves the guild, his arms wrapped around the three girls' shoulders. My lady's face is looking quite tense again. Which reminds me, my lady is one of His Highness Joel's fiancé candidates. Isn't she? Is she being nervous? We should get a move on before she destabilizes and returns to her habit of sounding high-handed again. Excuse me. Lady Sharon. That one Imperial Knight came back again. And he calls for my lady. I suppose they would know each other, considering they're both of Marquis families. Sir Andy, it has been a long time since we can talk like this, hasn't it? I apologize for my brother. N no, please pay it no mind. Besides, I must also thank you for your kindness the other day. My lady says, her face turning red in agitation. She seems rather flustered. Oh my. Might it be? My lady's heart to heart needs no intruder, so I decide to relegate myself to the role of observer. I erase my presence and move away without making a sound, climbing up the wall and clinging to the ceiling to watch over the bear. Hush now, little baby over there. Don't point your finger at people, that's rude. SHH. And then, to add to the atmosphere, I begin to hum a romantic tune. Your birth mother, Lady Kyria had accepted me as her student during her time as an imperial knight, and yet, Lady Sharon, if there is anything I can do for you, please tell me. Thank you, Sir Andy, for taking such good care of me just because I was her daughter? No, Lady Sharon, you are not just her daughter to me. Both I and my brother have known you ever since your childhood, after all, I still can't believe Carl would take such an attitude to you. 
and worse still that he would treat you so, when you are a fiancé candidate to his highness. Yes, my lady's expression hardens once again, and she clams up. Sir Andy gives her a bow and return to his highness' side. I stop humming the romantic tune to instead switch over to something more melancholic to fit my lady's current mood. She finally realizes the background music and looks up, her mouth agape upon finding me. LLL Letty. I jump from the four meters high ceiling and land without making a sound, gracefully dropping into a bow right in front of my lady. Hush now, that staff member over there, I don't need the applause. Letty why how were you there? Because I am a maid, my lady. I proudly answer. My lady doesn't seem to be satisfied, for some reason. TSK, that bitch is getting a big head on her. I can't imagine why his highness Joel could have picked her as a fiancé candidate, and what's up with Kamishiro. Such a stupid look. She's getting cocky too. As the group moved away from the guild, Carl's two male underlings plus Botten and Denko, two of the middle school girls, launched into a stream of disparagement with surprising coordination. Meanwhile, the group leader himself was behind them. Carl walked in silence, every single one of his steps radiating a displeasure of unknown reasons. Nobody dared to be the first to make conversation with him. Walking next to him was Hina, one of the summoned students. She was deep in thought. On that day, Hina was the one to have thought of the prank to push Kamishiro, the girl who had been a thorn in her eyes, down the cliff. Hina used to go to the same primary school as her. She had looked up to him ever since they were children. It wasn't even a crush, she liked him the same way one might like an idol on the other side of a screen, that was all. Upon entering middle school, when she first met the girl named Kamishiro, she saw the face the girl hid behind her bangs only by sheer chance. Hina's own appearance still made her look a bit like a child, and she longed to have the kind of figure and beauty that Kamishiro had. Hina was envious, and it irked her that the target of her envy continued to hide behind that curtain of hair with head always hung low, and when Hans started trying to talk to the lonely looking girl, Hina's envy turned into hatred. Hey! You don't like that either, right? Hina said to the boy next to her. What? Carl growled. Hina almost shrunk back, but she swallowed her nervousness and proposed her idea. Then. Wanna lend me a hand? An, the most dangerous threat that the young lady and her maid faced was their food expense. 7. Dungeon. With Lady Sharon leading the way. We arrive at the third dungeon in the eastern district of the city, the entrance is guarded by the kingdom's soldiers. In this country, the harvestable resources of its dungeons have long since been an inextricable part of its citizens' livelihoods. On our way to the dungeon, I saw inns, diners, taverns, equipment stores, dealers that would pay for made-in dungeon items, and other such establishments that cater to explorers all over the place. It turns out that in this country, People working jobs related to explorers or dungeons actually take up a whole 30% of its population. I suppose the mining towns of Earth in the old days would have looked similar to this. My lady, I have a question. What? Huff. Is it? It was an hour's walk from the guild to arrive at this dungeon. A relatively short distance. Nevertheless, we have been walking rather quickly. And used to the lifestyle of a noble as she is, my lady is being somewhat out of breath at the moment. It makes her look quite sultry. She's monopolizing all the gazes of the male explorers around us. No surprises there, the jiggliness is rather obvious. I have heard that dungeons attract monsters. In that case, how do dungeons inside cities replenish their monster supplies? A. Eh? My lady shows an adorable expression with her mouth wide open. It seems she hasn't ever thought about it before. You um, yes, that's right. The soldiers must be going outside of town to capture. Excuse me, sir, yes, you, sir, the rather intellectual looking mister with the glasses, I say, 30% a compliment, would you mind answering something for me? At least let me finish talking. Letty faced with a cute little lady in her teens and her maid, the glasses wearing man in his late twenties, who also looks like he's never had a girlfriend, is all too happy to talk. According to him, outside the city and in the dark woods. There are holes in the ground that only suck in monsters, people call them monster pitfalls. These strange pitfalls only ever appear around a dungeon, and so the current leading theory is that these holes are tunnels created by the dungeon, like roots of a large tree, in order to capture monsters. Thank you for your answers, Mr. Glasses. Farewell. Once again, 
I'm struck by how convenient this world is, truly. For example, skills, in a normal world. I doubt that the idea of quantifying skills in visible form would even exist. Perhaps this world might have an administrator of sorts. I haven't ever met one before, however. I only know what the May Chief told me. At any rate, the gist is that administrators are those who act the role of gods. Some among them even believe themselves to be actual gods and tell whatever sapient life forms on their world that I am your creator, but apparently, there's no such thing as a being powerful and human enough to create a whole world. Those with the capability to create on a planetary scale would have mindsets much too alien for them to perceive the world in that way. Administrators can be broadly categorized into two types, one, they could be the will of the world type, one that acts like an enormous computer to maintain the world in an eternal, mindless vigil. This type is fine, but the second type, parasites that have latched onto a world, are a lot more dangerous. The reason is that some parasites may have human minds and emotions and they would isolate a country or even a whole continent from the rest of the world to turn it into their playground. That sort of parasites are rare, it seems, but if this place turns out to be a carefully managed sandbox world, then things might just get troublesome. Oh yes, Letty, we will need to prepare your own equipment too. My lady says in sudden realization. She then looks into her wallet and frowns. There is no need my lady. I do not particularly mind. But I do. We're going to the dungeon to earn money in the first place. We wouldn't be here if we have the spare money for equipment. We'll just turn it back later. You will be getting some decent equipment, even if it takes all the money I have. No objections allowed. Understood, my lady. My lady has made her decision. As her maid, it is no longer my place to say anything. If there is a thought to be voiced, however, then I suppose it would be that all the money she has isn't actually enough, then may I be allowed to make my pick of equipment, my lady? Of course, go ahead, and so I go in the store alone while my lady takes her rest, I return 15 minutes later right on the dot, my maid uniform still unchanged, Letty. What is that? A fortunate discovery, my lady. My lady seems to want to say something more, but she hasn't needed to worry. She should know that a maid's uniform is also her combat armor. What I purchased was a single weapon that took all of our funds. With this orc killer in my hand, I am as a bull given wings, as a maid given a feather duster. What a strange metaphor. Letty. This orc killer that I bought is an enormous spiked club made of magic iron. Magic iron is iron that strongly retains mana, and the strength of the material would improve upon attuning with the user's own magic power. This thing has been collecting dust in a corner of the weapon shop, from what I've heard, it has drunk the blood of so many orcs that it has since turned into a sort of cursed weapon, it's extremely effective against orcs, but in return the weapon would enrage every orc that catches sight of it, nobody wanted to buy it, it was how I managed to get it for so cheap. The shopkeeper was blubbering in tears when I bought it, he must have been overjoyed to have finally managed to get rid of it. I'm sure it wasn't because I used the maid style shopping technique to get it for a quarter of the price. Come, come, let's go, my lady. Hey wait are you really sure that's enough? So it is that we enter the dungeon without any problems. This third dungeon is inside a city, and thus it isn't particularly difficult. It's suitable for even students and beginner explorers. Fundamentally, Dungeons mean resources. Useful dungeons are protected by the countries, while dungeons forming in farmlands or are undesirable in other ways would be exterminated. This particular dungeon is one of the more unusual ones. It generates a very useful resource, rock salt. The country very much values the third dungeon, for it removes the need to import salt. And now we come to the reason why this dungeon is considered a beginner's dungeon. The monsters inside this dungeon all have high blood pressure possibly due to their high sodium diet, which weaken their kidneys and subsequently, their health. I see that the meat of monsters here wouldn't make for good ingredients. I'm not going to eat monsters from anywhere, Letty. The food in this world all contain mana, as mana is also a sort of nutrient, food rich in mana would taste stronger. The obvious conclusion would be that animals that have turned into monsters due to mana would taste more delicious. Unfortunately, this is not so. The meat of monsters has too much mana, and anyone eating monster meat would get a stomach ache. Which is why monster meat isn't normally eaten. There is a method to remove the mana, but there is also a more fundamental problem that removing mana doesn't fix, the taste. 
Monster meat tastes so strongly that no one can eat it much. In other words, monster meat in this world is seen as a sort of canned food with the most offensive smell ever. I can deal with the smell and taste too. Yet the caterpillars and centipedes hadn't been very well received by my lady. How strange. I thought it was delicious. We enter the dungeon. There's a lot of people inside. About as much as the amount of people walking around a shopping district in the early morning. I would say. El Letty, stay behind me. It's dangerous. Yes. My lady. My lady is acting like an older sister protecting her younger sibling. So precious. She's wearing a second-hand set of leather armor, with a staff in her hand that also looks used. She really looks the part of a magician. Unfortunate for her efforts, her much too obvious clumsiness just makes her look like a baby lamb that people should protect instead. And now, the wolves that walk and talk like young human men are coming closer. Hey there, young ladies. Would you like to? My, there's a caterpillar. A giant caterpillar just happens to show up at the right time. I jump out from behind my lady and crush it into paste with a swing of my spiked club. The magic iron club is still intact even with my magic pouring into it. What a wonderful weapon. This caterpillar was around two meters long. It felt weaker than those in the dark woods. If I remember correctly. Ah. But my lady is standing stock still with her staff in hand. My apologies for interrupting your conversation. Holy shit. A crawler just got one shotted. I give my one meter long spiked club a light swing to flick off the caterpillar juices on it. The men's faces pale. And they immediately make their escape. Letty, didn't I tell you to stay behind me? That's one of the stronger monsters on the upper floors. Yes, my lady. A maid's place is certainly behind her mistress. I nonchalantly return to my spot behind her. Indeed. No maid should be so brazen as to stand in front of her mistress. Do you actually understand what I am saying? My, I have erred, it seems. On the other hand, my lady now knows me to be combat capable, and she has allowed me to fight in the front. Right. Letty. You've killed crawlers in the dark woods already. Haven't you? I used a kitchen knife and a pot lid back then, my lady. Anyway. We decide to go a little bit further in, partly to avoid the men's irritating gazes, too. I believe His Highness Joel and Carl have been going into this dungeon not to earn money, but to train. This dungeon has been here for almost a thousand years, and it has over a hundred floors. It's unlikely we would meet those nuisances if they've gone deeper in. My lady, this wall here has a different tint to it. Ah, that's salt. So there's a new floor now. We've finally found what we came here for. My lady takes out her mining tools. Those caterpillars have magic stones inside them, which can be sold for five small silver coins, about 5,000 yen, each. However, like last time, I'll be keeping them for the magic tools in my lady's room. I have no plans to sell them. One 500 grams pot full of salt would sell for two small silvers. Somewhat expensive, as I expected. Just this single mining spot should net us quite a bit. I can't believe we found a floor with salt so close to the surface that's still untouched. We're really lucky this time. Indeed, fortune must have smiled on us due to your good deeds, my lady. See come on, Letty, not used to being praised, my lady immediately turns bashful. I can't believe her family would turn their backs on such an adorable young lady. Perhaps I should take matters into my own hand. L. Letty, you're looking kind of, um, evil. Oh my, please forgive this maid. My lady looks so cute I accidentally let loose my inner pervert for a moment. What in the world are you talking about? It's love, my lady. The love between a mistress and her servant. Would it be time for us to return, my lady? Let's take a look a little deeper. Maybe we can even find a dungeon item. The unexpected hall has gotten my lady quite eager. The salt we've collected is currently inside my lady's bag of holding. Apparently it uses magic stones as batteries to allow one to store around 100 kilograms worth of things in it. No matter how large or heavy they are. It's very handy. It also makes me wonder why my lady has it, considering how poor she is. According to her, it was one of the things her birth mother had left for her as well as the only thing she had managed to keep for herself. The more baggage it stores, the faster the magic stone would run out. Perhaps we should try to hunt more monsters on the way for their magic stones, then. Following Lady Sharon's guide, the two of us go deeper inside. I stay on guard, 
at times using my magic power to intimidate and chase away the small fry monsters that wouldn't be profitable, preventing them from approaching my lady. Then I feel something moving deeper in. I stop, Letty. I feel the presence of humans, my lady, though somewhat some way away. It wouldn't be a problem if they are simply other explorers. Still, I recommend caution. Got it? My lady nods, her face serious. She understands what I wanted to say. My lady's relatives aren't the only ones to spurn her so, as her undeveloped skills in control of magic has also caused her to be shunned by her peers. Noble houses of lower ranks and commoners wouldn't dare show her contempt. Of course, but there are still people like Kyle. Better to be cautious than not, and he used to be such a good, honest kid back then. My lady, is it your hobby to set up flags so enthusiastically? My lady, please step back. I step in front of her the moment I feel several presences coming from further ahead. What happened? Something is coming. Not people, it seems. They walk on two legs but their footsteps feel much too heavy and warped. Wag, appearing in front of us are green-skinned the monsters with faces resembling pigs. My, my, how strange. The monsters immediately go mad with rage the moment they see us, slamming their wooden clubs against the ground and making quite a lot of unpleasant noises. Oh orcs. My lady squeaks. I see, these monsters are orcs. Then perchance, was my orc killer actually the flag that has called them here? 8. Sympathy. Let's see, one little pigman, two little pigmen, three little. Well, quite a lot. Less than ten, however. These orcs hold wooden clubs in their hands and wear chest armor, as crudely made as they are, and some among them even have wooden shields that resemble large pot lids. Yet despite all that equipment, they all have nothing but flimsy rags to cover their lower halves. Why would my lady happen to know the reason? I ask, in case it might be a weakness I can exploit. Eh? That's, um, it's because. As pale as her face had been upon seeing the orcs, she now blushes crimson, looking like she might just cry at any moment. Come, come, my lady, please answer quickly. Oh orcs, um, attack women. And, with those deary eyes and scarlet cheeks, my lady is looking like the cutest creature in the world right now. To be honest, I already had an idea of the reason why, but I think I'll still ask her again tonight for a more detailed explanation. A anyway, be careful, Letty. Yes, my lady, as a maid who have received her mistress encouragement, I can't afford to show her a less than stellar performance here. I ready my orc killer. The orcs visibly hesitate despite their rage still as potent as ever as though they see the wielder of orc killer to be both their worst arch enemy and their worst nightmare at the same time. Is it truly such a terrifying weapon? So, I have described it as a spiked club, but that might not accurately convey how it looks. This type of weapon does have a name, in fact, it's a morning star, a weapon in the shape of a spiky ball affixed to one end of a length of metal. The difference is that while normal morning stars are one-handed weapons, this orc killer is much more likely to be classified as a two-handed one. It has a completely metallic shaft one meter long with a diameter of four centimeters, while the iron ball at the end is the size of a small watermelon. The ball itself is covered in horrific-looking spikes as big as ice cream cones. It's even heavier than my lady, as a matter of fact. As brutal as it looks, a club is still a club. It's quite puzzling how they can fear it so. I hide the orc killer inside my skirt to see what would happen, and the orcs immediately, visibly relax. Letty, what are you doing? I can hear the panic and fear in my lady's voice, quite understandable. The moment I hide away the spiked club, the orcs no longer look so hostile. Instead, their faces turn. Debauched, I suppose is the word, as they leer upon my lady and me. Bad piggies. You've signed your own death warrants the moment you looked at my lady with such gazes. I'm the only one allowed to look at her like that, after all. What in the world are you saying? Oh my, it seemed I let my thoughts slip once again. And also, I can't exactly let this go on for too long. We seem to have an audience, after all. Anyway, I suppose I should start off by eliminating the root cause for my lady's fear. I walk forward, as graceful and elegant as a maid should always be. An orc roars, charging forward not with his club, but his bare hands. Wah. I turn my head to the side to avoid his strike. I attack. Splat. Wah. Arg. Thud. 
First came a bursting sound of impact that made everyone reflexively cover their ears, then the orcs groan of agony, and finally the sound of a huge body collapsing onto the ground. The remaining orcs tremble, stumbling backward as their hands instantly move to cover between their legs. It is called a maid kick. Where did I kick? You ask. Oh my, shame on you, to ask a lady such a delicate question. Wa dot wa. One of the braver orcs charge forward, looking as though a hero stepping foot toward the final battle of his life. Splat. Ag. Thud. The orc collapses frothing at the mouth, eyes rolled back, the rest are shivering with legs crossed looking as through they might flee at any moment now. My lady is sending me a rather prickly gaze, but well, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. I'm absolutely not doing this because I'm starting to find it rather fun. Not at all. I walk toward the orcs with a beaming smile on my face. They trip over themselves, trying to get away. Plop splat. I disable two more orcs with made kicks in rapid succession. I walk toward my next target nearby and the orc frantically shakes his head, terror apparent on its face. I get ready to unleash my maid kick. N no, and am interrupted by someone in a full set of plate armor charging between me and the orc, so I jump back. His face is hidden behind a helmet, but I can still see him squirming with legs pressed together even as he points his one-handed sword toward me. What might be your intention, sir? H how could you be so merciless? My? Whosoever might he be? S. Sir Kyle. My lady whispers. Ah. I was thinking that his voice sounded familiar. Though I couldn't quite place it. So inside the suit of armor is that Cal, then. Well then, Sir Cal. What might be your intention? I can't allow you to continue with such cruelties. What could he be referring to? How puzzling. I look toward the remaining orcs. And they are now looking at Carl as if he's their messiah. My, how beautiful. I exclaim genuinely moved by the sight before me. So there can be understanding between humans and monsters, is it? Not like this, not like this, Carl wearily mumbles. Then a girl's voice comes from the hallway that Carl came out of. Sir Carl, what are you doing? Aren't the orcs attacking her so you can get Kamishiro? She is. Um. Well, whatever her name is, she used to be my classmate, as well as one of the girls who pushed me down the cliff back then. And also, did she just say something rather unfortunate? For her, I mean, ape. I send her a stare and her face rapidly pales. She takes a fearful step backward. Oops, I accidentally let a bit of my magic leak and intimidate Diha. I should be more careful. It wouldn't do for my true nature to be revealed now. Hina, you be quiet. That's not what I meant. We were just going to scare her a bit before I swoop in to save her. Eh, oh yes. Her name's Hina. I never forgot. Of course, apparently they haven't communicated much despite being co-conspirators. I don't know how they managed to get these orcs toward a floor so close to the entrance, but they certainly seem to be the culprits. Sir Kyle, Sharon, I couldn't care less about you yourself, but I cannot accept you having a partner. H how dare you. I can feel some rather twisted emotions coming from Kyle. Fine then, just Kamishiro will do. Orcs, get her. One of the orcs immediately make a move upon hearing Hina's voice, so I pacify it with a maid kick. Splat. Wa dot a ah, thud. It appears Hina possesses a unique skill along the lines of monster domination, or charm, but her skill also seems much too weak to do anything more than a nudge in their minds. It might get rather troublesome if she is to be allowed to do anything more. I rapidly move toward her. Wah, there's no point in leaving her alive, and besides, she had done me a wrong she has to answer for. I unhesitantly squeeze her neck, yet even as fearful, as painful as she looks, she still lives. H help, how strange. That should have been enough strength to crush boulders. Letty, stop. Yes, my lady. My lady's orders are absolute, and I immediately loosen my hand. Ina sinks down on the floor. Sheer relief, as well as a faint smell of ammonia, emanates from her. I don't particularly care for Hina, but you, Fluidy. Carl says, clink clanking toward me in his suit of armor, have a duel with me. A duel, sir? Yes, a duel. That said, I won't tell you to become my partner if I win. You just have to give up on being Sharon's. Sir Carl, you have no rights. My lady shouts, stay out of this, Sharon. To dare take that attitude to my lady. It seems I shall have to crush him. Then I shall accept. Letty, have no fear, my lady. I flash my lady a smile. Carl is just going to have an accident, that's all. All right. 
let's go. Wah, come on brutter, get a wah, me like pretty ladies but me make exception for you, brutter. The orcs are cheering Carl on. I understand non-human languages too, but I think I shall spare Carl the knowledge of their words. Carl swings his sword at me with no hesitation. He must have seen my fight with the orcs, then. I take out my orc killer as I think about what sort of accident he should have today. The orcs gazes instantly turn into one of dark hatred, even as they stumble backward in fear. Can you even swing that thing? Carl shouts. I sure can. I can twirl it like a pen, too. But it's not the time for him to know I can use it, not just yet. I dodge Carl's sword, pretending to lose my balance, and only then do I slam the spiked club into his neck. With a beautiful sound of impact, Carl flies. <laughs> Strange. TSK. It really is as heavy as it looks. My attack should have broken his neck. Yet he still stands up, looking pained but not especially injured. But it won't be enough to get through this armor. This hallowed sanctuary that has been the Mercia family's treasure for generations. Carl sounds full of confidence. It is good armor, I must admit. From what I can see of the armor's magical flow and materials, Carl's trust in it isn't unfounded. Still, I find it rather curious that my strike just now didn't even manage to make him unconscious. I spare a few moments to gather my thoughts. It was the same when I attacked Hina. They can't die? Yet even if a skill to prevent one from dying exists, it's unnatural for both of them to have it. Then is it just the way this world's system work? If that's true, it would be quite the inconvenience. It's my turn now. So, I can't kill anyone. In which case, it would be wiser to keep what I can do a secret until I know the reason why. At the same time, I cannot lose here. I am my lady's partner, after all. Wah 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 I look at the orcs so admirably cheering Carl on. And I think, what has caused this soul killer to be so reviled, so terrifying? They also hold the same gazes of dread for me as they do for the spiked club. <laughs> Perhaps. Considering its shape, it might just be. I stop holding orc killer in one hand. Instead, I grab it at the end of its shaft with both my hands and point it to the ground away from me. Meanwhile turning myself 90 degrees to one side and slightly bending down. What? The orcs wail the moment they see me changing my stance. What is that stance? Sir Cal, are you aware that there are many kinds of blunt weapons that can defeat a fully armored enemy by impact alone? I am, and indeed, even this hallowed sanctuary can't protect against such impacts. But that's a weakness that can be covered with magic. A spell has allowed me to retain my consciousness no matter what happens, as long as I'm wearing this armor. As he speaks. He takes out a shield from his back and transfers it to his left hand to hold. I've already prepared myself for blunt weapons. You have no chances, Fluity. Admit your defeat. Well then, please forgive my discourtesy. I twist my body and give my orc killer a large practice swing upward. Normally, large blunt weapons should be swung downward in order to leverage their weight. Normally, orc killer isn't a normal blunt weapon. The reason why orcs hate and fear it so much lies within how it's used. This weapon isn't supposed to be used with downward slams. Don't think of it as a morning star. Think of it as an iron stick with a heavy mass at one end. Does it not remind one of a certain something from Earth, then? Not a weapon for use in combat, but a piece of sports equipment. I twist my torso, drawing half a circle in the air with orc killer to bring it aloft behind my back, and I swing. The heavy end of Orc Killer scrapes against the ground as it speeds toward my target, between Carl's legs. Bang. Uck. Arg. Carl groans. He drops to his knees. Nice shot. I announce. D damn you. He whimpers. He still stands up again, if only barely. I swing my one iron club one more time at the same place. Bang. Fairway. I say. Urk. He can still make sounds. One more time then. Bang. On the green. Thank you for your applause, imaginary audience. So, while he might have prepared for impacts from above, it seems his protection doesn't apply to strikes from below. Carl is twitching now, his hands pressed between his legs. I raise one of his legs to prepare him for a last putt. No, stop it already, wag. But then, a chorus of soulful cries reverberate throughout the dungeon, in a wonderful moment wherein the hearts of humans and monsters all become one. What a beautiful thing it is, that sympathy can transcend all borders. 9. Brothers. A.N. This cannot be. The young lady isn't in this chapter. Andy de Mercia was an Imperial Knight Squad leader of our Grey Kingdom, 
one assigned to the second Prince Joel, in a usual knightly order, while the knight commander would always be a high noble, squad leaders were, as a rule, meritocratic positions instead. Only less than half of them were nobles, the rest were people who have climbed up to the position themselves. Things were different when it comes to Agri Kingdom's imperial knights, however. While other countries might not follow the same rule, here, those chosen as imperial knight squad leaders were almost always of high nobility. This rule was created after a certain incident in Agri's history. There had been a monster outbreak, monsters escaping the confines of their dungeon, and yet one of the royal family at the time had made use of the army for their own purpose, and nobody had had the political power to stop them. It had resulted in the near-complete destruction of a town. It was the reason why the imperial knights attached to a royal family member would always be chosen from families of high nobility that were relatives of the royal family. This granted the imperial knights the power to keep their charges in check, if the need arose. The previous queen had come from the Mercia Marquis family, as the prince's and princess's second cousin, and he had been allowed to enter the palace to be their playmate ever since he was a child. At first, Andy was to be assigned to the crown prince as he was closest in age. But after a certain incident, Andy was suddenly set to be Joel's imperial knight instead. What had happened? It was the death of Kyria, spouse to the Michel Marquis and, as according to the wishes of the Queen, also the woman who was to be Joel's personal bodyguard until her successor was chosen. Kyria had met the Queen at school when she had still been only a daughter of a Marquis family at the time, and the two had become fast friends. For the sake of her friend who had then entered the royal family, Kyria, despite being the daughter of a knight's family, had gotten herself adopted by a viscount's family who was close to the queen just so she could become the queen's imperial knight. Kyria's beauty and her silver hair had earned her the title of the White Rose, to accompany the sunflower that was the queen. Even after the Michel Marquis fell in love with Kyria at first sight, even after the two had a child, the two women's friendship never waned. So it was that the queen entrusted the protection of Joel to Caria, until such time that the boy decided on an official aid. These events had been ten years ago. At the time, Andy was still a student and a knight apprentice. He studied under Caria, his superior knight officer who had been very strict in his training, and as the two were both of Marquis families, he, as well as his younger brother, often played with her daughter, Sharon. The circumstances behind Caria's death was a mystery even until now. Almost immediately after her death, the Michel Marquis took a second wife, a woman from a Count's family, but the problem was that Johan, Sharon's younger brother of a different mother, was only one year younger than her. As young as she had been, knowing about Johan must have hurt Sharon terribly for a time. This fact had also given rise to rumors that Lady Caria had been assassinated, but they were soon quelled by the Marquis family. Sharon's grief had been heart-wrenching, both for her and for those around her. Andy had tried as much as he could to visit her and to console her, but he was still just a student, still just an apprentice knight. Not only that, he was also chosen as Kyria's successor since there was nobody else fit for the role, and so he found himself with fewer and fewer opportunities to meet with Sharon. However, Sharon had been a stronger girl than he thought for a time. There were even rumors that the Michel house was spurning her, yet as though to prove everyone wrong, Sharon had worked herself to the bone to perfect every aspect of being a noble lady, and her efforts had borne fruit. She was chosen as a fiancé candidate to the second prince, upon hearing of the news about the girl he had always thought of as a little sister, and he felt both sadness and happiness. On the other hand, Cal, Andy's younger brother, immediately began to lash out against her. Andy remembered that Carl and Sharon had been very close in their younger years, if anything, he thought Carl had liked her even more than Andy himself had. And yet that very same younger brother had turned cold to Sharon. Upon entering the academy, he even began to be overtly disdainful of her. Andy himself had scolded Carl many, many times, yet he showed no signs of changing. A rift had formed between the two brothers. The news that his younger brother had collapsed in the dungeon and had been carried to the nearest clinic reached Andy's ears. Details had been vague, however, apparently Carl had taken the Mercia family's treasure, the hallowed sanctuary, with him to the dungeon without permission, and that he had been fighting. As he had been attending to His Highness Joel, Andy was near the dungeon. Joel had graciously allowed him to take his leave to visit his brother, 
and so Andy came to the clinic. Carl, brother, Carl sat up on his bed, his body still shivering. Andy wondered what sort of monster Carl had been fighting. His face was pale and haggard, while his body was so bruised and battered he could barely move himself. Andy had also heard that after he was carried to the clinic, Carl had woken up and then immediately fell back to unconsciousness multiple times in a row, and that he was also poisoned, thanks to healing spells, however, his younger brother now seemed to have recovered enough to stay awake. This is quite terrible, did you meet with an ogre horde in the middle floors or something? Carl said nothing as he turned away, his expression inscrutable, he seemed unwilling to talk, losing is nothing to be ashamed of, considering your wounds. You didn't wear the hallowed sanctuary, right? Father would certainly scold you for taking it out without permission, but I reckon he'd be lenient if he knows you've had a change of heart. Carl continued to look away despite Andy's words of consolation. Cold sweat dripped from his skin, and he found his brother's reactions to be somewhat strange, but he paid it no mind. He had something else he had to ask, even when he was aware of the rift between them. Carl, I've heard that Lady Sharon was the one to have brought you here. Did something happen between you and her? Carl's eyes widened a fraction, as though it was the first he'd heard of it. I don't know why you've been so stubborn, but remember that Lady Sharon might just be our future princess. It's about time you grow up. You're such an idiot, brother, Carl said with obvious exasperation. Andy released a sigh mixed with a wry smile. It had been a long time since he'd heard such a tone of voice from his brother. Maybe I am. I'm not going to do that anymore. I see. Andy didn't know what had happened, nevertheless, as curt as Carl's reply was, Andy could still feel that his brother was no longer as bitter as he had been. And right now, that was enough. Mending bridges wasn't something that could be done in a day or two. For a while, Andy simply looked at his younger brother, his gaze kind. Then he turned round and silently stepped out of the room. Carl looked at his back until he was no longer in sight. He gave a small sigh for his dense older brother. If you don't make a move soon brother, then I will, did everyone think this chapter has been in third person narration, too bad, it was actually me, Furuti, currently, I am infiltrating Carl's room, clinging onto a corner of the ceiling while hiding my presence as best as I can, I'm actually surprised that nobody's found me yet, all the exposition above was what I've found out from using my maid interrogation technique these last few days, I just added a little bit of dramatization while writing the personal character thoughts myself from educated guesses. I've gotten the gist of it right, I believe. The older brother is just a blockhead, while the younger brother is far too stubborn. How deplorable. Their siblings all right. Well then, readers, you may be wondering why I wanted to come here so much that I would leave Lady Sharon to take her rest alone in a cafe. The answer is that I had a bit of an experiment to do. I wasn't able to kill either Carl or Hina, and I did not know why. There was a need to investigate the secret they held and how far this effect could extend. To start off, I waited until Carl fell asleep and dropped a string from the ceiling. I then released some light neurotoxin, which followed the string to drip into his mouth. His lungs seized up and he choked on air, but otherwise nothing happened. The medic hurriedly ran toward him and immediately casted healing spells on him, and that was it. I was relieved, seeing that at least my poison still worked. Then once Carl went from sleeping to being unconscious, I tried out some muscle solvent. His skin instantly turned mud gray, but just as I thought that finally did it, a dull glow emanated from him, and he was as healthy as ever again. Curses. With that, Carl finally returned to consciousness. I immediately strangled him with loops of stronger than steel thread wrapped around his neck and he writhed, thrashing in agony as his lungs begged for oxygen, but in the end, he just dropped into unconsciousness again. He still didn't die no matter how long I choke him. Results of my experimentation. I can harm people just fine. I simply can't kill them. There's nothing to indicate him being any sort of undead or immortal nor was there any sign of skill activation. Regrettably, I will have to give up here, any more and I risk discovery. How infuriating. To be fair, it's not like there aren't workarounds I can try out, but I think I'll keep up my observation for the time being first. I have more than one puppet to experiment on, anyway. With adhesive threads wrapped around my fingertips and t-tips, I briskly skitter across the ceiling. I reach the linen room of the clinic with everyone else none the wiser. MMM. Apologies for the wait, Hina. How are you feeling? I've packed Hina up tight with straw rope, 
using my thread would have left some rather undesirable evidence, and buried her under a mountain of linen sheets, but she still looks as lively as ever. I hadn't taken much care when I tied her up, so Hina turned out to look a bit like a honeycomb, but, well, she'll probably be fine. I remove her gag. Hina glares at me. Her eyes deary. K. Kamishiro. Oh yes. Do you need to relieve yourself? Just as well that there's some adult diapers here. And no, please. I'll be quiet, just don't. I see. I did recall her smelling a bit ammoniac in the dungeon, so I thought it would be about time. What a shame. Please. I'll apologize, just don't hurt me. Understood. She does seem quite sincere in her remorse. I wonder what could have caused such a change of heart. I untie her and let her sit down. She looks at me, looking perplexed. You're holding your head up high now aren't you? That is because I am a maid. Might she be referring to my earlier days? Her face is reddening somewhat. She looks like she wants to say something. What is it? And nothing. It's not like I'm thinking you look better like this. Not at all. Really? Just what did she want to say? So anyway, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I'll tell you something interesting. My, my. Ina stands up and whispers. So I overheard this one girl from our class muttering something. She said this world is a not-home game, apparently. I see. Excuse me, does this clinic has a psychologist? Stop. I'm normal, I tell you. I'm not crazy. How ridiculous. Hina must be making it up, right? A.N. By the way, our protagonist has also cordially invited the young lady Hina to help out with her experiments. She agreed. Of course. 10. Counterattack. Among the nobles in their final school year at the Magic Academy, there was a certain young lady of a Viscount house. Her father was an inveterate womanizer, and her mother was a songstress famed for her beauty across the town. She was born a commoner, but after the second Prince Joel was born and she was acquainted with him at the academy, she was taken away from her mother and formally entered the Viscount family in the hope that she would become the prince's favored wife in the future. The Viscount's wife did not accept her, her birth mother sold her for money, but despite her home life, the young lady still stood strong, head held high even when her family treated her with such antipathy. She grew to become a kind girl. Inside a room in the girls' dorm of the Magic Academy, the glow of a lantern lit up a chessboard. The light unusually warm and hazy. Clack. Slender fingers moved a piece. Her icy gaze was fixed on the board, but her clinical thoughts were of a game much, much more vast. M. My lady, tea the food is already. From a corner of the room came the fearful voice of a maid younger in age, a girl who still hadn't outgrown her freckles. Am my lady? The young lady's cool gaze flicked away from the board for a moment, and she replied frostily. I'll eat later. You can retire for the day. Why yes, my lady. The maid shivered. She hastily bowed and returned to her servant's room, as though running away. With her thoughts interrupted, the young lady faintly sighed, her slim back leaning back on the chair. She arranged several pieces on the board. How many shall remain, I wonder? Lady Sharon, please wait. Sir Andy, how fortunate that you haven't left. Lady Sharon, I apologize for the trouble Curl has caused. N no, there's nothing you have to apologize for. If anything, I should be the one to. Excuse me, it's nothing. We are schoolmates, after all. I only did what was expected of me. Wonderful, as a fellow noble. I truly wish my brother could be half as honorable. Ah. It's really nothing. I will make sure to have the Mercia family send our formal gratitude to your house on a later date. And also, Lady Sharon, if I may. Why yes. No, please pay it no mind. I shall have to return to his highness side now. So if you would excuse me. Yes. They both should grow a spine already. Greetings, everyone. I am Floridi, Lady Sharon's maid and her protector from the shadows. Today, I am inside a store near the third dungeon. My lady is standing stock still in the middle of the road, so deep in her melancholy that she doesn't even notice she's being surrounded by snot-nosed urchins. I do wonder what she might be thinking, but I have something I need to do first. Sir Shopkeeper, how about this price? You're kidding. Made less. This city isn't that starved for salt. We have dungeons and all. This shopkeeper is already in his forties and the skin on his head has lost much protection from the sun, but he's still quite the formidable opponent. There is a branch of the Explorers Guild near the dungeon and they do buy salt too, but I can generally get a better deal by selling directly to merchants. 
It's why I'm here. Even with this quality, sir? My salt has just been mined from the dungeon. Oxidation hasn't set in yet. Come now girl, didn't I say there's not that much demand? Considering the quantity my shop usually handles, by only that much salt is just going to lower my brand quality. Emphasis on generally. If one doesn't have the necessary skills to negotiate with the merchant, one might even get haggled down below the fixed price that the guild would buy for. My, my. Like the merchandise over there, you mean? Made Lias, just what are you implying? The shopkeeper narrows his eyes and glares daggers at me. I simply respond with a beaming smile as I take glances at the pots of salt he has on his shelves. Do you really need me to say it, sir? I've heard that sometimes. The salt might be mixed with a certain something to create brand distinction and the make them taste nicer, 10% more. That's the best I can do. If you don't like that, go to another shop. 20%, I've seen how much they sell for around here. Sir, you'll still be profiting more than enough when you resell my salt. Now, now, pretty little maid. Don't you think you're getting in over your head? Jua asked a little bit. My, would I have to sleep with a dagger under my pillow tonight? Ha. Huh. You jest, I'm doing honest business here. Cut it out with the false accusations. My store even has dealings with a trading firm that supplies for the royal family. Imagine if their customer blacklist has one more made on it. A trading firm, you say? The one providing food for the palace this month? I'm sure the firm wouldn't be supplied those salt, right, sir? The shopkeeper grimaces. My smile brightens. Don't be so glum, sir. I can throw in a little something for you too. What now? I open my bag to let him see what's inside. Look stride. What is this? Perhaps you haven't had many opportunities to see this. Considering how far away from the sea we are and that the country also doesn't import salt. This is seaweed, sir. Seaweed? I look at his scalp. It's something very good for you, sir shopkeeper. My shopping trip ends without problems. I sold the salt for seven golds and four silvers, combined with the sales of monster materials. We have quite a bit of funds now, and not only that, the shopkeeper even threw in some spices, what a kind man. I walk toward my lady, still brooding, and give the gawking urchin some rock candies to shoo them away. Lady Sharon, apologies for the wait, I call at her. Eh? Ah. My lady returns to reality, she turns toward me with an overcast smile. Welcome back, Letty. I managed to get quite a good deal, my lady. So I've also bought some of your favorite baked sweets. We will have a feast tonight. Thank you, Letty. No more monster meat, however. Of course, my lady is a bit fussy, isn't she? I give her a broad smile. I understand how she feels. I shall not make the mistake of revealing the ingredients' origins again. No, that's not what I meant. Well then, after I did a psychological checkup on Miss Hina with a little pharmaceutical aid, my conclusion is that there is nothing wrong with her mind. How strange, a sensible person would never have said something like that, and I don't think I misdiagnosed her either. Her whole body was twitching, her eyes were vacant and without focus, and she was drooling with her mouth set in a dopey smile by the end, so surely that was enough medication. Oh yes, don't worry, I only used a weak spider poison. It's all organic. Hina won't be having any long-lasting after-effects. After all, poison can be medicine in the right dosage. Not like I've ever studied pharmacy, however. So, Hina said that this world is a not-home game, but she just couldn't recall the identity of the one to have whispered something so ridiculous. Honestly, I half expect I can shake her head and hear the one single brain cell she is rattling in there. All the same, I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand just because it sounds absurd. An exemplary maid is one who can prepare for anything and everything. It's impossible for a world to be a not-home game, but it is possible for a carefully managed sandbox world to look like a game. While I'm not sure how large this one is since sandboxes can vary in scale, considering that there are certain people here who can't die, the possibility of an administrator is very high indeed. Truly, so much trouble, I think I shall continue to keep myself hidden until the investigation is finished. Letty, are you done with your preparation? Yes, my lady. Currently, I am helping my lady with her morning bath. It is a task that requires my utmost concentration. Today is the day my lady Sharon's beautification project, which has started several days ago, enters its final phase. I carefully, meticulously wash and rub hair treatment into her locks of silver. 
I caress and exfoliate my lady's skin with a washcloth made from the best spider silk. And now that my lady is dozing off, I begin to massage every single corner of her body with a specially made aromatic oil that I got directly from the maid chief. Yet even with all that I must do, I cannot take too long. A lowly maid's duty must not take up her mistress' precious morning time, and if she has to use all her magic to bend space time to accomplish her tasks, so be it. My lady, it is done. Wah. My lady awakens to see that her hair has already been styled, her uniform already on her. She seems surprised when my lady has slept quite well, as she takes nibbles and sips of the breakfast I've made, cafe au lait, fresh orange juice, and a bagel sandwich, she looks at me with blushing cheeks, her glare still showing dissatisfaction with my answer. Even until now, my lady continues to be rather embarrassed whenever I help her change her underwear, I suppose that might be what had displeased her, it is simply a maid's duty, my lady. I know you've chosen to serve me, but Letty, your, um, my lady turns away and continues her words in a near whisper. You're also, my friend. So, you know, my lady. Too precious. Thank you for the feast. What feast? What are you talking about? Feasts for the eyes, my lady. Feasts for the eyes. Including but not limited to the times you get dressed, for example. Well then, to explain what my lady meant when she spoke of my preparation. It is the arrangements for me to join her in class. And the reason why is because the kingdom has decided that, as a part of the partner selection process, all the middle school students summoned from Earth would be transferring into my lady's class of noble students in order to help them acclimatize to this new world. Letty. What about your uniform? I thought they gave you one? Indeed, the country has provided me school uniforms. My lady is asking only because I am still in my maid attire. A maid needs only one uniform, my lady. Is that fine? It is, it is. And honestly, the maid uniform I made with my own threads is of better quality. At any rate, of course, I've also secretly replaced my lady's uniform with the material. She is now stab proof. As long as it's a knife doing the stabbing. Um. Do I look strange? As today is the first day I accompany her to class, my lady is being quite nervous. She acts just like a mother doing a school visit with her child for the first time, though in all honesty, I would say she's the kid, not me. I wouldn't tell her that, though. Silence is golden. No, my lady, if anything, you look more radiant than ever today. GG's, stop that, you say that all the time. Come on, let's go. Yes, my lady, she's perfect. Of course, I've taken days to make sure of that. Clack, clack, the Marquis' daughter, Lady Sharon, strides through the school hallway with echoing footsteps. Commoners and low nobles hurriedly make way for her. My lady has perfected all that there is to know in being a noble, and she often give pointers to her juniors quite harshly. It is the reason why she has gained a bit of an intimidating reputation. But today, something has changed. The moment the students of low nobility who have fearfully given way to her take a look at her and truly see her, all their faces immediately flush pink, both the boys and the girls. Letty, are you sure I don't look strange? Upon noticing their unusual gazes, my lady turns to me and asks, her worry apparent. I smile sweetly. I am, my lady. We come to the classroom. I silently open the door and as she crosses the threshold, all those who catch sight of her immediately quieten. A moment later, the room erupts into chaos. Sharon, is that you? The first to approach her and speak is the Prince Joel, after he recovered from his days. Yes, um, yes, His Highness Joel, I am Sharon. My lady, despite her confusion, still replies with her usual grace. Good, good, everything is proceeding as planned. As my lady has been neglected from her childhood by the trash that calls themselves her family, her hair and her skin have not had the care they deserved. That isn't to say that my lady wasn't beautiful, she still was, I simply helped her beauty to regain its true glory by managing her meals, improving her nutrition, and caring for her hair and skin when she used to have to do it by herself without really knowing how. My lady is a new woman now, and how? Just look at the reactions of this whole room. Let's begin, my lady. The stage is set for our counterattack. Eleven, class. Most of the class is already here. Everyone, from the students of the academy to the middle school students from Earth wearing the same uniforms, all stare at the lovely girl in sheer astonishment. 
My lady already has beauty in her genes, after all, I simply helped her return to a healthier lifestyle and gave her a bit of a makeover. And lo and behold, the goddess Sharon has seen fit to descend in all her splendor, filling the world with her light. No 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 what are you saying? My lady frantically blocks my mouth with her wee little hands, despite the fact that I was only whispering as I expected of my lady. Her lack of experience in receiving praises has helped her develop a talent to sense any and all words of compliment. Truly commendable, Lady Sharon. Hello, readers, it is me, Flurity, the maid who can never manage to keep her thoughts about her mistress to herself. I must admit, Sharon, I too am truly surprised. I almost couldn't believe my eyes. You're gorgeous. Prince Joel says, the gaze he gives to Lady Sharon having completely changed. Ah, I, um. Thank you, your highness. So too does my lady blush as she replies, her voice full of bewilderment. Then she glances at me, myself having stepped back so as to not interrupt her conversation with the prince, and she acidly whispers my name. Letty, I knew this would happen. Of course. It is exactly why I've been keeping her away from mirrors since morning. Mwahahaha, the gazes people send my lady vary quite a bit. Some are honestly impressed. Some are infatuated. Some are simply surprised. While some are spiteful. Of course, I can't just outright decide which ones are my lady's enemies and which ones are her allies based on only their gazes, but I can get a rough idea. The Prince Joel is half impressed and half infatuated. I would say. Which reminds me, my lady is technically his fiancé candidate. Isn't she? He hadn't ever paid my lady a lick of attention before. And now that she looks better he's suddenly in love. He really is a sleaze. That aside, the looks that the girls sent to my lady have turned quite a bit harsher. The prince hadn't paid any thoughts to where they are when he complimented my lady. Sharon, if you would not mind, may I invite? All right everyone, return to your seats. We're beginning the lesson. Just before Prince Joel could finish his words, Instructor Eric shows up to return the class to order. My? He's looking my way. I wonder why he seems so hesitant to speak. Miss Flurity. Where is your uniform? The Marquis young lady's change have been well received, more or less. As a matter of fact, the main reason why Sharon had been ostracized was simply because no one knew much about her. Was it because she had become a fiancé candidate to Prince Joel, and thus became the target of jealousy from the other young noble ladies? Yet she was but one of five candidates, and the other four hadn't been spurned so. Was it because of the high expectations that she held for others, being the proud noble that she was? No. Pride was one commonality all nobles shared, no matter what form it may take. Furthermore, this academy also expected its upperclassmen and high nobles to become role models for, and provide guidance to, their juniors. There was no cause for Sharon alone to be condemned. Was it due to Sharon's lack of skill in her magic control, despite being of a high noble house? Not quite. While the fact that her problem had stemmed from her family hadn't been announced outright, many among high nobility were still aware of the rumors, and she had quite a few sympathizers among the older generation. Was it due to the severe glare she seemed to have on at all time? You couldn't change genetics, and some might even say a strong gaze shows a strong will. Perhaps children might be scared of her, but it would be impossible for grown men and women to not understand that. Then could it be the combination of all the above? Perhaps, yet that would mean that Sharon's detractors would have to be deeply envious, without dignity, ignorant of the happenings of the noble world, excessively condescending, and also be incorrigibly cowardly children. And these sort of people were always the loud ones they would have to be, if they wanted their wrongs to be right. So it was that they became the first to shun Sharon, and as a result, they dictated the first impression people had of her, and inertia was a powerful force. It was what had made other people begin to avoid Sharon even when they had no particular cause to. Breaking a person's preconceptions held since they were young would not be a simple task. Success, however, would then be rewarded with opportunities. The summoning had provided the occasion for many of Sharon's contemporaries who hadn't known of her before to see her for the first time. They were no longer children, they were young men and women with value and moral systems in accordance to their age. Regardless, when they saw the girl standing alone and away from everyone else, they still found it hard to approach her. As it turned out, she was the first to gain a partner, an unusual one, to say the least. The partner and her operation, 
All boys like a cute girl with big tits were what had wiped away all the preconceptions about Sharon that the young men in their puberty had been holding. Yet some had not viewed the change in a positive light. Included among them were naturally the green-eyed, ignoble, ignorant, contemptuous, and craven children as mentioned above, but they weren't the only ones hostile to Sharon. There were also the heroines who knew about the at-home games. As complicated as the games had been, players could encounter many, many different dialogue patterns with each playthrough. But one thing remained constant, as one of the villainesses, Sharon would always appear multiple times to harass the main character. She was a necessary device in raising the seduction target's opinions of the main character. It was why the heroines needed Sharon to be the black sheep of the class. As the Earthborn students would be attending class for the first time today, the period would simply be a review of the basics of Magecraft. It was an occasion for the academy students to help them out and teach them. It's a group date, is what I'm saying. So now we're being split into groups of four to five people, and to my extreme, extreme regret. I and my lady are in different groups. I'm worried. She has zero skills in making friends, after all. Hello, um, Fruity, right? Welcome to the class. A student of the academy, a girl with a golden head of fluffy hair, greets me with a gentle smile. Greetings, miss. I hope to be your acquaintance. I reply. R, feel free to call me Clarice, alright? We're all friends here. The young lady Clarice is quite cute, I must say. She looks like the main character of a Shuo manga, she gives off the impression of a girl who can be friends with anyone, the direct opposite of my lady. Other than Clarice and me, our group has one more male academy student and one of the girls from Earth. Hey, I'm Cosimo. Man, it's real stressful being surrounded by so many beauties. Come, come, Ginko, sit here. Yeah. Oh yes, I remember her. Her name is Ginko. She's looking at me with somewhat intense eyes like she doesn't trust me. Really? Ginko hadn't needed to bother. She should know that I only enjoys that sort of gaze when it's my lady doing the glaring. Cosimo, a boy who's totally a skirt chaser judging from his appearance, is currently desperately trying to make passes at Ginko. He's harmless. Then, the smiling Miss Clarice has taken it upon herself to be the group's leader, so there is no worry on that front. As it happens, we generally study about the history of Midgecraft before learning the basics, as it would better deepen our understanding. Fluidity, how much of the history have you heard? I have not, Miss Clarice. Kamishiro, there was a lecture last week for us Earth people, you weren't there. Ginko says, my, is that so? I didn't think it was important, and I don't think anything could be more important than my lady. There is no need to slow down on my account. I can find a book later. I say, truly? Then we shall begin with Ignite. We're starting off with the utility magecraft. The term describes spells of convenience such as making a small flame, or pouring water into a bowl. Magecraft and magic might seem to be the same thing at first glance, but in fact, magecraft refers to well-analyzed spells used in talismans and magic circles, those which anyone can cast to create the same effect, while magic are spells that can have varying effects depending on the caster. Magic and magecraft spells are similar in that they both utilize words of power to give direction to magic power in order to cause a magical phenomenon. Interestingly, I must note that these words are very very similar to the language us denizens of the Dark World use. First off, Miss Clarice and Cosimo would demonstrate the spell for me and Ginko, as we are both complete newcomers, and then it would be Ginko's turn and mine. Ignite. Wah, I did it. Ginko didn't have any problem. Ignite, I say, as I rub pencils together fast enough for them to burst into flame. My? The group is strangely silent. That's not Midgecraft. Same difference. I still made fire. Why would the method matter? At any rate, it seems I can't use this world's magic very well. But enough about me. How is my lady doing? I give her a covert glance. Despite being in a five-person group, amazingly, she still manages to be isolated. She was unfortunate enough to be sorted into a group with only girls and the one academy student and three middle schoolers from Earth aren't even trying to hide the fact that they're ignoring my lady. Those insects look like they might try something. Um, Fruity, I understand you may be concerned for Miss Sharon, but could you spare me some of your attention? Hearing her words, I turn back to Clarice. She looks at me with an unfathomable gaze. Might I still have a chance to be your partner? 
if you would be interested, next time, we can, boom. That was me flicking my wrist to throw orc killer, the weapon flew through the 50 centimeters gap between the female academy student and my lady to embed itself into the wall at the end of its trajectory. Instant silence. I make use of the moment to stand up, my hands pinching my long skirt, and I give a bow to the classroom full of people shocked still. My apologies, there was a bug, there really was, there was also a large cockroach about to throw the dead bug onto my lady's hair. I return to my seat and smile sweetly at the people sharing a table with me, they're still frozen. Once again, my apologies to Miss Claris, please continue. No, never mind, Miss Claris seems to be quite pale, does she have anemia, Letty? No more stuff like that, understood? Understood. My lady. My lady scolding like an older sister is cute, too. After that, instructor Eric reprimanded me and tried to confiscate talk killer. Emphasis on tried. When he saw it didn't budge an inch despite his efforts, he made me do a written apology. Really, men these days are so frail. It's just a bit heavier than my lady. Letty, did you just think something rude again? I was wondering why my lady's breasts seem terribly heavy yet they still float in the bath. What has that got to do with anything? Truly a mysterious phenomenon. At the moment, even as she is still blushing bright red after she so easily believed my distraction, my lady is still kind enough to accompany me to the faculty room. An apology letter is quite tedious, isn't it? That's getting off really lightly considering what you did, Letty. I mean, the Count's daughter was even frothing at the mouth, yet from her tone of voice, my lady doesn't seem to mind at all. She must have been harassed by that young woman for quite a long time. I should have crushed her. It looks like, the other girls were Hina and her merry band, so I had nothing to worry about. The girls named Denko and Botten, if I remember correctly, were just about to snap at me before Miss Hina frantically stopped them. Her face ghastly pale. Truly, how fortunate it is that there was no lasting after effect. I should give her a reward later just a drop of medicine once she's asleep, I'm thinking. Ah, as we walk down the hallway, my lady suddenly stiffens. Lady Sharon, wondering what might have happened, I look at the direction of her eyes. There, I see a girl, plus a boy with an attending maid. They look at my lady with some surprise. Elder sister, Yoan, I see. So that is Lady Sharon's younger brother, then. One of the pieces of garbage that call themselves her family. Twelve, siblings. It is now later in the day after my lady, having become even more beautiful thanks to all the love and devotion that I had showered her, has finished reinventing herself to the class. She is now having a reunion with her younger brother, a member of the family that has been giving her the cold shoulder. Can Lady Sharon display the dignity of an elder sister? Let us see. Sister, it has been some time. You look different. Truly? I, as well. I'm relieved to see that you are in good health. The younger brother named Yuan seems to be honestly surprised. On the other hand, my lady is looking very much stone-faced. No wonder she gets misunderstood all the time. But that doesn't make her any less cute, any less lovely. Yuan is a boy with blonde hair and a face that makes me think he's going to be kidnapped by some older woman sooner or later. He doesn't look very similar to my lady. He shares her violet eyes most. I suppose, of the two ladies standing behind him. The one who looks like his personal maid is glaring at me. Quite galling. Do you want to have a go? Do you? Yet that selfish part of yours hasn't changed at all, sister. Deciding a partner on your own like that. Have you no consideration for his highness Joel? I am not being selfish. As a student of the academy, it is a fully justified partnership. Aren't you his highness's fiancé candidate, sister? Did you not think that perhaps you should wait until His Highness decided on his own partner? Really? I have to wonder why someone like you was chosen. Stop bringing disgrace to our family. Where did I put my orc killer? Letty, noticing my indignation, my lady whispers, her hand grasping my own. Ah, so soft, so smooth. Understood. If Lady Sharon wishes to tolerate them, then as her maid, it shan't be my place to make a move before she does. Seeing my lady's lack of resistance, Yoan begins to get cocky. He looks at me and spits out. And just who is that maid? Did you hire her? If you have the money, why not pay me what you owe? Unbidden, my lady and I look at each other. It seems that being of a different academic grade, Yoan hasn't heard that I've become my lady's maid. Um, Yoan, she's... Ah, my apologies, 
Lady Akairu. Family matters or not, I have still done you a disservice. Were you bored? No. Um, the other girl standing behind Yoan is Akairu, one of the summoned middle school students from Earth. She was long, black hair, and quite a graceful air about her. According to my memories, she was from a well-to-do family. Kamishiro. It's been a while, I guess. My, my, what strange happenstance that we would meet here. I remember her. Of course, I remember what she did to me. Oh, do you two know each other? Um, yes. I am acquainted with her. I say, guilelessly. The young Miss Akairu faintly frown. We're not friends, Akairu. You know that, don't you? Lady Akairu is one of the partner candidates of this year's summoning. I saw that she wasn't familiar with this academy, and so I have offered to be her guide. Yes, and for that I am truly grateful. Yoan has been most kind to me. Ha ha ha. It is but a matter of course. How can I leave such a noble and lovely lady to fend for herself? They are smiling at each other now, each looking not at all dissatisfied with the other. Are they going to start getting hearts in their eyes? Would they even hold hands? Maybe I should prepare some pink curtains. Yo Anne, she is a partner candidate. What do you think you're doing? Have you forgotten your place? As well versed in common sense as she is. It is no wonder that my lady is upset. Despite saying all that to his sister and being of a different school year that has nothing to do with the partnership ritual, that very same Yoan is now being intimate with a partner candidate. I smell a scandal incoming. Can you shut up, sister? I'm just taking care of them since you haven't. Whoever you chose to be your partner candidate, I'm sure you did it by shouting them down like you did to me just now, didn't you? And when all partner candidates inevitably reject you, there's going to be one extra person. No, you're wrong, Letty and I. Hey, that maid over there. My sister forced you to serve her, right? Want me to lend a hand? Ah, yes, as you and Lady Akairu already knew each other, you can be her maid. I'll pay you double the wage. Why, Yoan? Akairu says, shocked by Yoan's incredibly idiocy. Double, you say? Even your whole life isn't worth that much. Please wait a moment, young master Yoan. Right then. The attending maid behind Yoan walks forward. She is a woman around 20 years of age, with the same kind of blonde hair as Yoan. I have heard that he has inherited the color from his mother, and also that when the woman entered my lady's family, many of her relatives had also been hired. This maid might be one of them. It would not be prudent to have her as Lady Akairu's maid right away when we don't even know who she is, nor which ditch Lady Sharon had picked her from. Then what do you suggest, Mia? If I may propose, she should first receive a full education as a servant of the Michelle house. This lowly maid, Mia, shall take responsibility and beat her into shape. So-called Mia says, smirking at me. I see. This is how they've been removing my lady's allies. Yoan, how dare you? What gives you the right? Don't you owe me, sister? Mia, how much is her debt? The filth's just ignored my lady entirely. Yes. Young master, Lady Sharon has borrowed about three gold coins. Mia takes out what looks like a contract. Excuse me. Two gold coins and eight silver coins. My apologies. Even as a servant of a Marquis family, being so vague would have earned me ridicule. However, including interest, Lady Sharon would be required to pay back thirty gold coins. I thrust a sack full of gold coins into her hand, at the same time snatching away the contract. W what are you doing? return it. So the exact amount is written here, I see. You won't be needing this anymore. Mia stretches out her hand with a painful looking grimace, her wrist seemingly hurt. I rot the contract, magical too, it looks like, and turn it into dust in an instant, right in front of her eyes. Ape. Mia frantically jerks her arm away as though she was just about to touch acid. How rude. My decomposition poison is made from all natural ingredients. It won't take effect right away. That aside, I am quite amazed that a magical contract is involved in an agreement between siblings. I wonder how degenerate one must be that they would do such a thing. And not only that, there is even a rather nasty curse in case of a breach of contract. W who are you? Yoan glares at me in surprise and wariness. Ah, my greetings to Sir Yoan, younger brother of my esteemed lady. I am Lady Sharon's partner and my name is Fluriti. I pinch the long skirt of my maid uniform and perform a perfect curtsy, one more elegant than any noble and yet would still not overshadow Lady Sharon. Wah! Yoan turns to Miss Akairu in absolute disbelief. Her? Huh? Yes, she is. Akairu reluctantly, 
quietly nods, Letty, Lady Sharon, my apologies, I have not consulted you before using our funds, no no, that's fine, are you hurt, incredible, my lady hasn't had a moment of hesitation as she ran to me, checking my hand after I decomposed the contract to see if I am wounded, instead of the money, she worried for me, I almost hugged her right there and then to give her head pats, but I control myself, a maid cannot do such a thing to her mistress, I'm overflowing with happiness, my lady, may I have some fun with you in the bath, what in the world are you talking about, s sister's partner, how can it be, how can someone so arrogant as you, no, this is not right, you've brought nothing but trouble to our house, it's impossible that a partner could have chosen you, even Carl has told me you've been trouble at the dungeon, he said he wouldn't accept it, indeed, Master Yoan, perhaps she might even be using some sort of forbidden magic to control her, rest assured, maid, I shall bring you to your sense, I wonder if both the master and servant really believed it, or if they're only doing this on purpose, well, I suppose that Demir, an improvement in Lady Sharon's reputation would be quite inconvenient for her, it is no surprise she would act so, I take a quiet step forward, standing in front of my lady to cover for her, my, how disgraceful for a maid of a Marquis house, I say, silent, girl, I will, you will, what, unable to hold myself back for much longer, I give me the widest grin I have, one only she can see, she freezes up, my, my, what an expression, Mia, it makes you look so, delicious, hey, that's enough, and just when it was getting good, I was interrupted, Carl, Sir Carl, in contrast to Yoan's shiny eyed excitement, my lady whispers his name with a conflicted cast to her face, Carl looks at the two and after a moment's frown, he sighs deeply, and what is it now, a fight inside the school isn't any better than a fight outside, you two, there's no way sister could have a partner, she obviously forced her, weren't you opposed to, Kyle, she is Sharon's partner, provisional ones as they may be, and it was Flority herself who made the choice, I no longer object, indeed, indeed, but, but, I heard that sister has inconvenienced you in the dungeon, I was just trying to help you, Carl looks at Lady Sharon for a single moment, trying his best to not let me into his field of vision, and turns back to Yoan, and since when have I asked for your help, he says, his tone brooking no dissent, I am sorry, Carl, Yoan hangs his head like a scolded puppy, it seems Yoan very much likes Carl, from what I can see, he considers Carl as both a friend and a brother one year older to look up to, yet even as he was chastised so, Yoan still sends glares at my lady and me, I still won't accept it, Master Yoan, R, Yoan, wait up, with a parting bite, Yoan quickly walks away, me and the young lady Akairu hastily follow, with the latter making a quiet TSK as she leaves, thinking that no one would notice, too bad for her, I did, Sir Cal, I apologize for my brother, as well as what happened the other day, no, that's already in the past, I don't mind, Carl says, yet at the same time his hip still instinctively flinches back, making him look a bit like a shrimp, should I pretend not to have seen it, in that case, allow me to take my leave, wait, Sharon, just a moment, Carl says in a panic, my lady turns back in surprise, why yes, um, back then, um, I'm sorry, Carl, what a strange atmosphere, what is this loud thinking, after all this time, still, being the exemplary maid that I am, I cannot interrupt their conversation, ah, but is this not a good time for some music, it's been a long time since we can talk like this, Sharon, yes, it is, hmm, hmm tilde, those days were nice, there was me, elder brother, and Lady Caria, too, yeah, hum, hum, ho hum tilde, I'd been a brat, eh, hum, ho hum tilde, I'm sorry, brother was an idiot, but me even more so, no, Carl, so was I, hmm 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 tilde, s Sharon, I, Carl, lalalala tilde, the two suddenly go quiet, they slowly, stiffly turn their heads to look at the ceiling, their faces twitching, Letty, what the hell are you doing? The wistful tune I hummed as I clung to the ceiling was not to their liking, it seems. 13. Homecoming. Akairu was born into a family that had been running a brewery for generations. Their sake was famous as a local specialty, so Akairu had wanted for nothing as she grew up. She knew it, too. 
Then her life took a turn once she entered middle school. Her earlier education had been a private primary school in a large city. She had spent her time as carefree as could be, playing with friends from affluent families and taking lessons in the arts. She had thought that her life would continue like this, that she would coast along through middle to high school to enter an affiliated university, but her grandfather, the chief brewer and president of the company at the time, had decided that she should move back to their hometown for her education. While it was only a 30 minutes car ride from the city, to a Cairo, the town might as well be in the middle of nowhere, no nearby trendy cafes, nor shopping malls that she could visit on the way home from school with her friends. Furthermore, the public middle school she would be attending didn't even have enough students to fill a single class for each of its years. Coming from an academy that expected actual decorum out of its students, it was quite a shock to a Cairo. Still, it didn't mean everything was terrible. The class had only 17 students, yet so many of them were good-looking people that it almost felt like they had been hand-picked. And of particular note worse and how, two male students who looked more than handsome enough to be models, the first time she saw them, even her own heart began to race despite herself. It was no romantic love. It was the kind of love a fan had for her idol. Regardless, it didn't change the fact to a Cairo, she might as well have found an oasis in the middle of a desert. With the social skills that she had gained in her earlier years of living among aristocrats, she smoothly put on her sheep's clothing and mingled with the class as though she had always belonged. So was the so-called honor student type, the kind a Cairo had often seen in her private primary school. But how, a sporty and roguish boy, was exotic to her. She began to act the part of an elegant princess to try to attract his attention. She had been certain, had been convinced that no country boy could resist a lady such as her. Yet Akairu's plan had fallen through just because of one particular girl. It was a half-Japanese girl who was conscious of her height, of her unusually colored eyes, of all the things that made her different from others, and so she always hung her head low, hid her eyes, and talked to nobody else in the class. And then, the two male idols of the class began to pay attention to her, perhaps they hadn't been interested in her in that way, perhaps they were just being kind. Still, it rubbed to Kairu the wrong way, she hated that they had ignored her in favor of the other girl, so she began her subtle arrangements in order to incite the three overt bullies that also shared her displeasure. She nudged their thoughts and guided their hands to do the dirty deeds while her own stayed clean. She hadn't done it because of any grand reason. If there was one to speak of, then perhaps she had simply wanted an outlet for her stress, for the frustrations that she had been enduring ever since she came to this town. The new status quo continued for more than a year. Then one day, all of the class, including Akairu, was summoned into another world. While some of the more delusional boys were exhilarated, thinking it was a hero summoning. Akairu immediately realized what the world around her was. It was the world of the online Otome game, Light, Darkness, and Love Online 2, the Millifel of Love, the country's name, the people's names, the situation. They were all extremely similar to the games. Akairu's father had thought his daughter unfortunate when she was made to go to a public middle school, so he spoiled her, he gave her everything she wanted. Among them, she found this game. When asked, her father had said that he never remembered buying the game. They soon put it out of their minds, however. In the game, other than the main heroine, the playable characters also included the middle school students who had been summoned from Earth. Believing that this truly was the world of light, darkness, and love online too, the Millifel of love, Akairu was delighted. Especially when she thought there was a chance she could meet a certain capture character from the game. Yo and a Michelle. 14 years old, son of a Marquis, a fourth-year student at the Magic Academy, brother of a different mother to Sharon, one of the villainesses, as well as the character to fill the cute little boy spot of the game's casting. Yoan was born from a union of true love between the Marquis and a lady of a Count's family. Fearing that the boy might be harmed by the Marquis' legal wife and Sharon, the Marquis had hidden him away. He grew up being told by his mother about his sister. Sharon, and her unbecoming conduct as a noble, and once he heard that that very same sister was now a fiancé candidate to Prince Joel, he was troubled, the player character would lend him an ear and listen to his worries, as well as his wishes to prevent his sister from committing any more misdeeds, they would be given the evidence by his mother, and upon bringing Sharon's crimes to light, 
they would fulfill the condition to have Yoan as their boyfriend. Yoan was a Kairi's absolute favorite character. Time after time, she won against her rivals in the online game to capture his heart. Perhaps her interest in how had been nothing more than a way to live out her fantasy in real life. She saw innocent Yoan in him, and she wanted to have for herself the mischievous smile that Yoan made whenever he was alone with the player character. She was sure that some of her classmates were also aware of the game. There was even a possibility that the main heroine, the Viscount's daughter, would become her enemy. So Akairu was careful. She wasn't such an idiot that she would reveal what she knew. In the end, her meticulous scheme to gain Yoan's affection was successful. She had been invited to meet his family. And yet, is she going to be in my way again? What a beautiful day today. Warm sun, cool wind, and even a bit of chilling malice off in the distance. So nice. Greetings, everyone. It is me, Fluriti, the eternal guardian of my lady's blessed bosom. My lady, there are several letters addressed to you in the dorm's mailbox. It is while my lady is taking happy nibbles of her snack, Kuina man and a cup of extra sweet milk tea, that I brought her the news. Eh? She blinks her doe eyes in surprise. While important correspondence between nobles are normally handed directly to the receiver, even noble students would have to follow the rules as long as they live in the dorm. It is always impressive to see that my lady continues to be the uncontested queen of loners whenever I check her mailbox. It still looks brand new even now, since even her family don't write to her. Letty, I know you just had another unflattering thought. I was just thinking that your arms these days have gotten somewhat plump. My lady. T that's because you feed me sweet stuff all the time. My lady says that, yet she still continues to munch on the pastry like a little hamster. So cute. Do not worry, my lady, it is necessary nutrition. You're still perfectly slim. I reply, smiling sweetly to her. Um, yes, of course I am. She radiates relief. She then takes another sip of the cup of milk tea that has so much sugar in it. The liquid is almost molasses now. I don't drink that stuff. I'll get fat. All right. Letty, give me the summary. Then I shall begin with your right arm's plumpiness. I'm talking about the letters. I shall have to check them out later in the bath. That aside, the reason why such a loner as my lady got letters is because of the reveal of her true beauty yesterday. As a result, there has been a deluge of invitations from delusional buffoons who thought they had a chance with my lady. Let's see. Then I believe the most important among them is His Highness Joel's invitation to a meal. His Highness? My lady's eyes bulge in surprise. It seems that whatever the prince tried to say yesterday, it wasn't simply a moment's fancy. Such a wretched man. He is. He used to pay not a hint of attention to my lady Sharon, despite the fact that she was supposed to be one of his fiancé candidates. And now that she has gotten just a bit prettier, he shows his true colors. All the same, his is not an invitation my lady can ignore. I shall arrange your schedule. That's fine. Anything else important? I saw through the letters. Rabbles and riffraffs. I'll investigate their names later. My, what is this? There is an invitation to a tea party from the young lady of a Viscount. Are you acquainted with her, my lady? The invitation is from Lady Clarice, one of the people in my class group. It seems I am also invited. We haven't really talked, but I also don't remember her ever be rude to me. Why did she send an invitation? Then shall I propose that my lady accepts, with the condition that I am also allowed to attend? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. My lady seems to be relieved that I will be with her. I see her hands fidgeting in apparent bashfulness. Well then, next is. I come to one particular letter. The moment I see it, I twist my body in a perfect half circle and hurl the letter with all my strength, sending it into the trash can in a corner of the room. There is nothing else notable. My lady. No 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 hold on I saw that. That was a letter from my family wasn't it? T.S.K. So she noticed. I reluctantly, begrudgingly pick up the letter that is the insignia of the Michelle Marquis family, pinching it with two of my fingers and holding it as far away from me as possible, and I give it to my lady. She wryly smiles. I understand how you feel, I really do. But moderate yourself. My sincere apologies. What a blunder, as I made to my lady. I have made a grave mistake. I bow in sincere remorse. My lady lightly pats my head and opens the envelope. Upon giving the contents a glance, her mood visibly sours. See, this is why I didn't want her to see it. 
The vermins that have been ignoring her for years now suddenly sent a letter, a little over four years, to be precise, as my lady entered this magic academy when she was ten years old, in all that time. She only returned home twice. Understandable, while this academy isn't exactly the best environment, it is still far more desirable than the compost bin that is her home. They never even gave her the support that they should have, much less a letter. What do they want now? What was the contents, my lady? Normally it wouldn't be a question a simple maid should ever ask, but this is an exception. They told me they've heard of my wrongdoings from Joan and they want me to return right away to explain myself. The younger brother again? And I suppose the wrongdoing is that I'd become my lady's partner? Such small they have. Just as well that His Highness Joel's invitation has arrived at the same time. Let us refuse, my lady. No, Letty, I can't run away forever. Besides, they might just let loose some unsavory rumors if I continue to ignore them. My lady sounds like she's speaking from experience. I understand. May I just say that it doesn't make it any less aggravating, however. Hearing my frank admission, my lady snorts. But this may be a good chance, too. I, um, I have you with me now. She says, smiling bashfully. Precious. Too precious my lady. Overcome with emotion, I instantly kneel in front of her and speak my vows once more. I, Fluridi, hereby solemnly swear that with my dynamite punch, the rivers will run red with the blood of all who wishes to bring harm upon my lady. I never asked for that. The next morning, after we have sent in our notice of absent to the academy, we leave for my lady's home. I never thought that strict dorm mother would actually lend us her personal horse carriage. She was very glad to help us, my lady. The dorm mother is an unmarried lady in her forties who is very harsh with the dorm's girls, but I'm sure she's a kind woman deep down. She was grumbling about my lady under her breath when she first heard we would be absent, but once she noticed my kind gaze, she paled and finished doing our formalities in no time at all. See, isn't she such a considerate person? She should rest assured, I won't tell anyone about her sneaking into town and buying young boys to accompany her. Then I shall take the liberty to be the driver, can you handle horses? Letty, the horse looked strangely scared of me when we first got on the carriage, but it soon turned obedient after some persuasion. To reach the territory of the Michel Marquis, it generally takes a day and a half in a carriage, but as we left early in the morning and the horse has been very enthusiastic. We arrived during the evening of the same day, the energy drink made from monster blood that I gave it along the way has worked well, it seemed. Here we are, Letty. I see, the Michel Marquis mansion looks less a mansion and more like a small castle. Painted by the light of the setting sun, the stone almost seems like it's been drenched in blood, it looks amazing. I stop the carriage in front of the gate. Despite calling us here. There isn't anyone there to welcome us. Not even the gate guards. I am Sharon, and I have returned. Open the gates, she calls out, her clear voice reverberating through the air. On the other side of the gate, I can see some people who look like the security staff playing cards. They look up in surprise upon hearing her voice, and then return to their game. You, open the gates now. I am, my lady, allow me. We can just return home. But that would mean my lady's determination would go to waste. I decide to take things into my own hands. My lady, whenever we visit someone, we should first knock. A. Eh? My lady's eyes bulge as she sees me taking out Orc Killer X. Orc Killer X is simply Orc Killer with its ball end coated in a kind of metal that is as heavy as depleted uranium. The metal had been thought as a cursed item that brought its owner toward a gradual and inevitable death. It had been languishing in a corner and it was why I got it at a fraction of the price. I can still hear some ghastly moaning coming from the weapon in my hand even now. The coating took really well, if I do say so myself. Hello, and excuse us, I say, at the same time swinging the spiked club. The gates made out of magic iron crumple like wet paper, dust billows around us. Cards fall from the stupefied gate guard's hands. I give them a smile then turn to my lady, who looks at me in open mouth shock. The gate must have deteriorated quite a bit. Come, my lady. Yeah, yeah, and so it is that we return to my lady's home without any problems. 14. Family. A.N. Warning, reading this chapter may cause high blood pressure, but don't worry, the maid is here. 
I put the spiked club back into my skirt and make way for my lady. The noise of the gate has caused the house to be astir with panicked shouts of servants. Soldiers come pouring out from the guardhouse. Lady Sharon? A call of surprise and recognition came from an older knight among them, yet the soldiers still raise their spears despite his words. Who do you think you're pointing those to? My lady answers them with dignity. The aforementioned knight follows up with a shout. What are you doing? Lower your weapons. Now. The soldiers hurriedly obey. Lady Sharon, what has happened here? The knight asks as he looks upon what remained of the gate. My lady gives him a cool glance. Bardo, these soldiers have not had enough training. You are the security chief of our Michelle house, and yet what have you been doing? I have no excuses, Lady Sharon. Bardo says, kneeling and bowing on the spot. My lady walks by him with poise and composure. The servants, the soldiers, the knights, all attention is on my lady, the target of their apprehension and their fear, their disdain and their scorn, their anger and hatred. She still walks forward, undaunted. Truly commendable, my lady, although her heartbeats are quite elevated and her eyes are teary now. I'm aware that whenever she gets stressed, she would automatically turn stony-faced and her tone would get a lot colder. She must have been very scared. I'll give her a lap pillow and lots of head pats later. Greetings, everyone. It is I, Fluriti, the maid who would be the happiest in the world if she is to be allowed to comfort her mistress. So, anyway, things are worse than I thought. Most of them have eyes of hostility, and even the best of them are either only neutral or apathetic. The number of people with a favorable attitude to my lady can be counted on one hand. While that old knight named Bardo seems relatively decent, I don't think I can expect much from him considering the quality of the soldiers here. What is going on here, sister? What have you done? My, so the brother has also returned. Yoan immediately makes a face upon seeing my lady. Behind him, that annoying harpy of an attending maid named Mia also shows herself. Lady Sharon, this is most disturbing. I would never have thought that a member of the Michelle house could be so barbaric that she would vandalize the gates so. T that's because these gate guards weren't. And now you blame it on others disgraceful. The repair cost shall be deducted from Lady Sharon's allowance, and, my, Miss Mia, might there have been a misunderstanding? My lady has done nothing. I say from behind my lady as I break my concealment. All the servants jolt in shock upon hearing my voice. W what, you again? Ill-mannered girl, has no one taught you to not interrupt others? Ah, my apologies, as I have just seen a servant doing the same to Lady Sharon. Daughter to a Marquis, I have assumed that it is simply a family tradition. Was I mistaken? I smile, tilting my head in a display of puzzlement. Mia's face goes through a gamut of colors. Why you? The gate guards there seem to have been hard of hearing, so I knocked. I never thought the gates would fall apart so. It must have deteriorated quite a bit, right? I turn to look at the gate guards who was playing their card game when we arrived. Their faces pale. Their eyes pinned to the floor. That's impossible. It, enough. Mia is stopped from launching into another tirade by Yoan, who looks somewhat exasperated. It wouldn't reflect well on our house to have a squabble here. Come in quick, sister. Father and mother are waiting. Follow me, Mia. TSK, understood. Soldiers, repair the gates. As Yoan and Mia return back to the castle, the soldiers and servants get to work. My lady grasps my fingers with her own faintly trembling hand. Letty, be careful, all right? Yes, my lady. I shall take proper care, please do not worry. I give her a reassuring smile. Her shivering stops, and she moves an inch closer to me. She's like a puppy. So cute. Lady Sharon, please go to the dining hall. The master and madam are waiting. Understood. The maid immediately walks away after she finished relaying her message, sparing not even a bow for my lady. Has any maid in this house been trained, my lady? It's fine. Letty, just let it be. It's always been like this. My lady replies to my complaint with a wry smile of resignation. She truly doesn't have any allies in this house, does she? Then let us depart, my lady. I will be with you. Yes, we shall. We seem to have returned to the Marquis Castle at just the right time for dinner. A call came before we could even leave my lady's luggage in her room. Fortunately, all of it is inside the bag of holding that she entrusted me so there was no problem, how deplorable the servants of this house are, upon entering the dining hall, glares of daggers immediately make us their targets, my, Sharon, 
I never thought you could be so shameless as to show your face here again. After all that, the voices of a caked face told Hag. Ahem, I mean, a lady with a generous application of makeup. The blonde haired woman is sitting at the head of the table. How strange. Why is she in that seat, Madame Jidel? Why are you sitting there? It should be father's seat. My dear husband suddenly fell ill and is taking a rest. How terrible he must feel to have such a dreadful girl as a daughter. Did you know? Just hearing that your back was already enough to make him faint. I, my lady bites her lips and says no more. Further has been most kind. He has allowed mother to take charge of the house's affairs, as well as letting her have the seat. Says Johan as he sits next to Jidel, sounding as though it was all his achievements. Take your seat, Sharon. We will leave the admonishment for later. The chef has had to make your own portion, seeing as you've returned much too late in the day. You'd best be grateful, Jidel says. I'm sorry. I give my thanks to the chef. My lady quietly replies. The maid in the room guides my lady to the lowest seat. Despite the fact that she should be sitting higher up than Yoan, a glut prickles my sense, and I turn to look. My, is that not Miss Akairu sitting next to Yoan? My lady notices her too, and she gives voice to her question. Excuse me, I would ask about Lady Akairu. Miss Akairu has accompanied Yoan home as his friend, and I must say, she is such a wonderful young lady. Ah, if only I can have a daughter like her. Akairu, getting used to an entirely new world must have been hard on you. Feel free to think of our house as your new family, and I your mother. Jidel says, smiling kindly at her. My, Madam Jidel, I would be most happy to. Miss Akairu replies with a beaming smile. Yoan and the servants look upon the scene in joy and contentment. Lady Sharon, dinner is here. The maid before slams a dish of food down in front of my lady. Honestly, calling it food would be an offense to cooks everywhere. The plate is full of worm meat and greens that, on a closer look, still have the live insects inside, as well as dirt and even pieces of gravel. I see Mia standing behind Yoan and sneering. As I expected, even my lady is shocked into silence. Jidel sees her and speaks, sounding absolutely delighted. It is all that the chef could make on such short notice. Eat, Sharon. I will not hear of any selfishness. Yes, my lady whispers as she takes utensils in hand. My lady, please refrain. I gently stop her before she could reach for the food, and I take the plate. El Letty, who are you? I have never seen a maid such as you. Know your place. Jidel shrieks. Apparently she hasn't heard of me through Yoan, with the plate on my hand. I guilelessly smile at her. My apologies. I am Furity, exclusive maid of Lady Sharon. As I do not work for the Michelle family, I am not required to follow your order. Wa, well, Sharon, what did you do this time? My, my. I would have thought a noble lady would be more graceful. Now, I shall take the liberty to have a taste of this dish, impudent girl. Are you accusing us of poisoning the food? I have only said that I would have a taste, madame, not testing it for poison. It seems the people of this mansion shares the same hearing impairment. I borrow the utensils from my lady's lithe hands. With a single mouthful, I clean the plate. <clears throat> Quite crunchy. These pebbles, aside from the sounds of my eating, the room is absolutely silent. Everyone's face is pale. Freshness, ingredients, cooking method, all are not to my lady's taste. I turn to her. May I prepare your dinner, my lady? It takes a few moments for her to start speaking. Yes, then, please enjoy. I place in front of her the food that I have prepared beforehand as insurance. It is my lady's favorite, omelette rice with the fluffiest eggs. I slice apart the omelette, releasing a flow of creamy gold to cover the rice and a mellow fragrance of butter. As the aroma of chicken rice, egg, and butter spread across the room, I hear somebody gulping. Instead of demi glace sauce, today the topping will be the very sweet kind of ketchup that my lady likes so much. With the ketchup, I draw a huge heart symbol on the dish. I make the same symbol with my fingers near my chest, and I look to Lady Sharon, together with me, my lady. Tasty, tasty, Momo Kayan. Um, tasty, tasty. I'm a lucky man. I'm thankful for everything that led me to this point. That led me to you. I'm a lucky man. Wait, what? My? How strange. This was what the maid chief had taught me to do whenever a maid makes omelette rice. Have I made a mistake somewhere? Open up, my lady. Uh, eh? Uh, my lady reflexively follows my lead. 
her brain not having rebooted yet, and I feed her with a spoonful of omelette rice. She chews like a little baby bird being fed her first meal. So good, I am glad, my lady. As I continue my happy feeding time with my lady, Miss Akairu is the first to regain her senses. She asks Kamishiro. What is that? This wonderful dish has been made from the meat and eggs of birds of paradise, as well as tomatoes that I have harvested from the forest of spirits. Letty. You used monster ingredients again. My lady says, sounding scandalized. They are ingredients that I am certain my lady would not be opposed to. Besides, my lady's every meal until now have always been made from some form of monster ingredients. What? Monster meats? They're almost poisonous, aren't they? Hearing the word monster, Yoan immediately jumps up and shouts. I chuckle and take out an ancient looking journal. It is, in fact, not so. An elf summoned several centuries ago had left behind this journal, which has since been stored in the Academy's library. Humans, or living beings in general, would become more powerful by absorbing mana. Overconsumption of mana would cause flora and fauna, life forms lacking in willpower, to be monsterized. The human body, however, would only find monster meat rich in mana to have an overwhelming taste and would respond with a gastric response as a way to prevent itself from absorbing too much mana. But an elf has done research into the phenomenon, and they have written as follows. If the taste and density of mana inside monster ingredients can be reduced down to a level that the human palate can find enjoyable, and if a person continues to consume such ingredients, then over time, his or her body would slowly gain the physical characteristics of elves. It seemed the elf's endeavor had been to help their partner live longer. The results of the research had led to some success in the removal of mana from certain monster ingredients, which was the origin of several delicacies we know of today. However, the food is still expensive, and the taste remains rather difficult to enjoy. But what about this? My lady says, staring at the omelette rice I made that she has tasted. Indeed, I have succeeded in improving the taste. Lady Sharon, I expect you will find yourself quite slow to age, as well as living relatively longer than most other people. E? My lady begins to pull at her cheeks in her surprise. Recently, her skin has begun to be as smooth and bouncy as that of a baby's. Why you, maid girl? Make me that dish. Jidel screeches with bloodshot eyes. And not just her, those among the female servants who are over a certain age are also looking over here with eyes full of desire. As I pinch my long skirt and drop into a graceful bow, I give them a beaming smile. My apologies, I work for Lady Sharon and her only. Fifteen, accusations, and so the first skirmish ends with Lady Sharon's sweeping victory. Even with all that the stepmother has done to her, taking away a Marquis daughter's maid, that's me, is not one of the things that are in her authority. All Jidel could do is to stew in her anger as she leaves the dining hall in stomping footsteps. The two of us try to visit my lady's father after the dinner, but a young butler stands in front of the room. We are not allowed in. Why can't I meet with father? My apologies, Lady Sharon. By orders of his attending physician, the weary master is not to be disturbed. But, my lady, I touch her arm, asking her to relent. Greetings, everyone. It is me, Fluriti, the maid who never misses a chance to savor my lady's soft and squishy arms. Let us retire for the day, my lady. Perhaps your fur there will feel better in the morning. Got it? My lady bites her lips and sulks like a kid. How cute. Seeing that we won't be pursuing the matter, the butler smirks. He is a decently handsome man who looks about in the middle of his twenties, with a head of black hair tinged blue, but his leering gaze pinned at my lady's bountiful melons and my own hips just ruins everything about him. But, well, I can understand him. My lady's recovery from her nutritional deficiency has made her already huge cantaloupes even bigger, after all. Letty, I have a feeling you're thinking something weird again. I was thinking that I like melons more than grapefruits, my lady, my, you do? So do I, I shall prepare some for you later, my efforts will continue until her own become the envy of all melon farmers. Hey, you, just as we are about to walk away, the young butler calls at me, lowering his voice so that only I hear him. I may tell you how the master is faring, but it'll depend on you. Get what I mean? The butler smiles suggestively so I respond with the same expression. Then, perhaps midnight, sir, in front of the large tree in the garden. Yeah, I'll wait. 
name's Dario. Remember it. Then he nods and returns to the door. I smile. I never said I would actually be there. After all, Letty, what were you talking about with that butler? He seems rather idle. So I asked him to keep watch on the garden until morning. Ah, really? 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 We head to my lady's room to take our rest. Quite deep inside the castle. I must say, there hadn't been much attention paid to this area, it seems, as I find dust still remaining on the window frames of the hallways here. This is my room. We arrive to a room to the north side. I open the door, and then quietly close it again. Letty, please wait a moment, my lady. I will air the room out first. Why yeah, I smile a saccharine sweet smile at her. She nods, looking uncomfortable, as a maid. It goes against every fiber of my being to see that her room has not been cleaned at all, even if she rarely returns. Furthermore, I am quite sure my lady does not have a hobby of collecting filthy bookcases and boxes of empty bottles. I suppose there is no other choice. I enter the dark room alone and unleash my maid cleaning technique. Anything not needed is returned to where they belong. Like Mia's room, for example. My lady, please enter. A. Eh? You're already done. If I took more than three minutes just to do this little bit of cleaning, that horror. Ahem. The most kind maid chief would reprimand me. B R R R. I still get nightmares sometimes. Wow. My lady exclaims in amazement. Everything unnecessary has been removed. All the sheets and curtains have been replaced with brand new, adorably patterned fabric. Mainly from Mia's room. They have been dyed as well. Nobody will ever find out. Well then, good night my lady, but where will you sleep, I can find a place, like on the ceiling, for example, you can't just sleep anywhere, we can share a bed for today, it should be big enough for two, and, um, you're my friend anyway, my lady, my lady is looking bashful like a little girl going to her first sleepover with friends, how cute, don't worry, my lady, I will be certain to take responsibility, what responsibility, the night is peaceful, and I enjoy myself with my lady's squishy arms until morning comes. That said, it is still dark outside. My lady and I walk, our steps carrying us through a garden still glistening with dewdrops. Over here, yes, my lady, in a corner of the garden is the resting place for Lady Caria, birth mother to my lady Sharon. The grave is a simple thing, just a stone slab carved with words, but well tended to. May I give my prayers as well? My lady, I don't mind. I place the flowers we've brought on the gravestone. As we mourn, I hear faint sounds of footsteps on grass behind us. Lady Sharon, France. An old man wearing a gardener's attire walks toward us and stops, kneeling in front of my lady. My utmost apologies. This is all I could do for Lady Caria. No, Franz, you've done more than enough. Thank you for protecting her grave. As my lady tells me later, this old man used to be a butler working at this mansion. After he retired, he continued to protect Lady Kyria's resting place as a gardener. Young miss, might you be Lady Sharon's attendant? Yes, Sir Franz. Lady Sharon has allowed me to be in her service. My name is Fluriti. Oh, I'm just an old man, don't bother with the sir. Letty is my friend, too. My lady cheerfully interjects. Franz watches her with the kindly eyes of a grandfather but the peaceful air is then suddenly broken. You, why didn't you come? My, my, such dark shades around your eyes, did you not sleep well? The intruder is, of course, that young butler Dario, I wonder what he has been doing here so early in the morning. Stop playing the fool, girl, I've been waiting all this time under the tree, indeed, thank you for watching over the garden. You, I truly appreciate it. His lack of commitment to his work to instead laze about in the garden had afforded me the opportunity to infiltrate the Marquis' room. After I confirmed that my lady had fallen asleep from the ceiling, I saw that the Marquis was a timid-looking man who showed no signs of waking up any time soon. I decided to check on him by injecting several types of medicine, and I confirmed the faint presence of poison. My own medicine was much stronger and had subsequently sent him into a coma, but it didn't matter. He didn't seem like the kind of man who could stand against that woman anyway, even if he was awake. Hold it, Dario. Mia. The second intruder is Mia, the rotten maid. Dario stopped just as he was about to lose his composure. I step in front of my lady and smile at her. Miss Mia, how may I help you? I have business with Lady Sharon. Move. She growls, her face haggard. My, you look quite tired. 
Did you stay up all night? S. Shut up. All the garbage in my lady's room had been carried to Mia's, but I thought just piling it up wouldn't be interesting, so I set them up as an interlinked mass. Pulling one thing out would make an entirely different thing fall apart. It would actually be rather simple to clean if she intentionally triggered all the traps to break it apart, but considering her fatigue, it was likely that Mia hadn't done that. She probably took until morning to clean it up bit by bit. You did that, didn't you? My. Do you have evidence? I am also searching for evidence to find out where most of my lady's allowance had gone to. I say, staring into her eyes. Mia flinches. Lady Sharon and you. Go to the dining hall immediately. The madam is waiting. Understood. I wave at her, smiling. Mia grinds her teeth giving me a glide that is shared by Dario. She drags him away. My lady is silent as she looks at me with open mouth dumbfoundedness, while Franz just nods at me, seemingly impressed. By the way, before we leave, I also secretly decorate Lady Kyria's grave with some Magitech neon lights and disco balls. I follow my lady as we enter the dining hall. Jaidel, Yoan and Miss Akairu are already seated, taking bites of what looked like sausages and potatoes as their breakfast. And since my lady doesn't have her portion, obviously, I give her a plate full of fluffy pancakes with judicious syrup and scoops of ice cream. Miss Akairi looks at me with obvious irritation. My, does she want some? I don't mind as long as she asks. No guarantees it wouldn't earn her the ire of the harper nearby though. After the stepmother finishes her pickled greens, she glares at my lady and opens her mouth. Sharon. I have something to say. What is it? My lady turns stony-faced again. It cannot be helped. She has the heart of a rabbit, after all. After the stepmother spare me a glance as a warning, she airily waves Dario over. He brings to her some sort of document. I see that you haven't had the best reputation at the academy. Are you aware that as a fiancé candidate to his highness, you have brought disgrace to the house of Michelle? His highness Joel has permitted me to have Letty as an attendant. The problem is how the other nobles see it. With all that has transpired, I've come to believe that you are not fit of the name Michelle. Madame Jidel, what about father? My husband agrees. He has woken up, though still bedridden due to fatigue, and I have asked for his thoughts this morning. It cannot be. Father, my, how strange that Jidel could talk to him when he was supposed to be comatose due to my medicine. My lady is a kind girl. She has always endured tolerating everything that had been done to her because she does not wish for conflict, she still wishes for peace with her stepmother, even as wicked as the woman is, and her younger brother, even when he shares only half of her blood. From my research, I understood that in this country, the family is generally inherited by the son. In case the daughter is the older sibling, then she would be relinquishing her claim to her younger brother in order to keep up the tradition. It is how things work according to the letter of the law. At least, my lady intends to let Yoan inherit the house, yet it does nothing to curb Jidel's fear of her, of the daughter of the Michelle Marquis' first wife. Though I would say that the real reason is because Jidel hadn't exactly been on the right side of the law with her dealings. Really, Lady Sharon, please admit your crime. I and so Yoan will forgive you, Miss Akairu says, suddenly and without even a hint of emotion in her voice, as though she is reading from a script. Miss Akairu. You are far too kind. Would you allow me to stay by your side forevermore? My, Sir Yoan. What is this farce? They say love is blind, but as love also makes you deaf. I am astonished that Yoan could say that after hearing Akairu's bland delivery. Or is something railroading him? Well then, never let it be said that Furuti the maid cannot read the mood. Then it would be wonderful if we can witness the proof of their love, wouldn't it? I say, surprisingly. Everyone looks at me as though I just spoke another language. W what are you? Miss Akairu stutters like an actress who has no idea how to ad lib. I explain. Nobles have a duty to bring back dungeon items for the country. While asking servants to do it in one stead is all fine and good. I am sure that nobody wishes to be the target of rumors among nobles, saying that one is nothing more than a child of a concubine. And what better way to silence them than to enter the dungeon oneself and take back something worthy. Somebody shut that maid up. Jidel screeches. Her maids rush at me. I take out a few cupcakes, waving them in front of the maid's eyes, and I throw them far away. They are anti-aging cupcakes. I say, ah. As the ravenous wolves chase after their prey, I turn back to Yoan. As lacking in achievements as you are, so Yoan, 
I believe it may be difficult to gain Lady Akairu's hand in marriage. If my Lady Sharon goes, she would certainly be able to gather a dungeon item fit for a true successor. Or, perhaps you do not have the confidence, sir, I tell him, filling my tone with provocation. His hackles rise as Yuan shoots to his feet, don't underestimate me. I won't lose to sister, I swear I'll bring back a dungeon item. He turns to my lady. Sister. This is a duel. I did not think it would be this easy. An. Here we see a maid who would pick a fight with the whole world for the sake of her mistress. 16. Duel. Alone in the guest room. Akairu paced. What do I do? She hadn't made any wrong choice. Compared to the other targets, Yoan's route was relatively simple. By nature of being an online game, the interference of other players could cause certain alterations to the story. Nevertheless, a constant still remained, the player with the highest affection stats would be given evidence of Sharon's crimes from her mother, Jai Dao. During the prosecution of Sharon, by admonishing her while still advocating for leniency, the player character would then receive Yoan's profession of love. If the player answered his proposal, the flag for Yoan would be established. Afterward, as long as the player kept his affection high enough. They could do whatever until the graduation event, be it spending the days all lovey-dovey with him or even ignoring him to go seduce another target. Yet before Akairu could give her answer, she got in her way again. As it was still rather early on in the game's timeline, Sharon's misdeeds were still light. In the game, the crimes that the villainous was guilty of could vary depending on when her tribunal happened. If she was prosecuted during the graduation event, she might even be executed for treason. Akairu wasn't the kind of person that could knowingly consign the villainous to execution without guilt. Even as early on in the timeline as they were, she had full confidence she could establish Yoan's flag before the other players interfered. She had cleared his route so, so many times, after all, so she had acted. She made her moves with such assertiveness that it surprised even her. And she had succeeded in acquiring the affection of Yoan as she stayed hidden from the eyes of the other girls who could be player characters, as well as the Viscount young lady that was the main heroine of the game. Status, Akairu whispered, a panel, translucent as though made of acrylic, appeared in front of her. This was a kind of magic that no one else in this world, other than those who were aware they were player characters, could use. The first time Akairu tried out the chant. She had done it thinking that if she could see her status in the game, she could do it now, too. And to her surprise, the spell had worked. Name, Akairu, female, 14 years old, status, good, skill list, skills with our hidden, water magic aptitude, noble blood, alchemy aptitude, foreign tongue, charm, weak, comma goddess blessing. She hadn't much interest in the skills that were public to her. They were only convenient skills to have in this world. Akairu's attention was on the hidden skills instead. She suspected that both were skills that only player characters could have. She didn't know what Goddess Blessing was, but Charm was what had helped her to gain Yoan's affection. It was what had made him hear her lines, even sounding as wooden as they were due to her nervousness, as a heartfelt speech full of passion. Yet right at the end, Akairu was thwarted once again. Was she a player character too? Then perhaps she might be the kind of troll player that played not to capture any target, but only to mess with other people. I won't let you spoil my game. Akairu had already forgotten what she had done to the girl in the past. To Akairu, she was just an enemy now. Two knocks came from the door. Yes, I am here. Upon Akairu's reply, a maid opened the door to reveal the madam of the house. My, Madam Jidel, Akairu. Can I have some of your time? Jidel was smiling, and in the woman's hands were some documents that were presumably the proof of Sharon's crimes. Seeing them, Akairu smiled as well. Akairu had still not yet realized that this world was reality. With Yoan's official declaration, the competition becomes a duel between siblings to determine the next successor. Jidel and the servants had tried to get Yoan to stand down at first, so I gave him just a little bit of a push, or so the little widdle less boy can't do anything without his mama, and he suddenly found his motivation. A lot of it too. In fact, even Madame Jidel seemed to have changed her mind. Hey Letty, what did you say to Yoan? Simply some encouragement. My lady. She didn't hear because I was blocking her ears. I simply could not let her innocence be spoiled by such bad words. But, 
I didn't want to have to fight my own brother. My lady's expression somewhat darkens. Such a kind girl, she is. Helping a younger brother gain strength through a trial is also an older sister's duty. My lady. Really? Yes, it really is. It's also an excuse, but she doesn't need to know that. The all-important details of the duel are as follows. Until the next morning, my lady and Yuan must bring a valuable dungeon item back from the dungeon that lies in the western region of the Michelle Territory. This dungeon is medium-sized, with about 40 floors. It used to be famed for its high-quality agates until over a century ago, when its yield of the gemstones dwindled down to almost nothing. The dungeon had since turned into a lair for monsters. Both parties are allowed up to 10 servants to accompany them. This rule is mainly for Yuan's benefit. Of course, my lady, I shall accompany you, France. I truly appreciate the thought, but you shouldn't. What if something happens to further when you're not here, my lady? I. Besides, I also need you to protect mother's grave. I fear her resting place may be disturbed if you get injured, France. Understood. France kneels, his voice full of reluctance. My lady tenderly places her hand on his shoulder to console him. I will be fine. Letty is with me. Look. Franz, over there. Something is shining in the evening sun. Is it not beautiful? It is. If only Lady Kyria could witness this with us. Indeed, if only Mother was here. The gleaming thing is, in fact, Lady Kyria's grave. Franz accompanies us all the way to the dungeon in a horse carriage. He says his goodbye as he prepares to return to the Marquis Castle. Then I wish you good fortune, my lady, Miss Fluriti. Please keep her safe. He looks at me with eyes full of trust. Of course, then I must prove myself worthy of his trust, too. By the way, the horse carriage we used was the one I borrowed from the dorm mother. The horse that pulled it is now rampaging in the forest and devouring all the monsters it comes across, even with the carriage still attached to it. It must have been the monster blood I gave it. This is great. Saves on fodder, too. My lady, it seems young Master Yoan had already entered the dungeon. My. At the dungeon entrance are corpses of what look like goblins, as well as the footprints of multiple people, expecting that we may have to stay awake all night. I had let my lady take a nap. It was why we had arrived later in the evening, after Yoan. W well then, let's go. Yes, my lady. We hadn't taken her leather armor with us on our homecoming trip, who would expect we'd need it. So my lady is now wearing a robe made from my threads. I have my usual maid uniform on. Of course, our way has already been cleared, just as I planned. It won't take much time for us to reach the depths. Yeah, my lady shouts, smacking a skeleton on the head with her staff. It collapses. She has relatively more magic power than most others, but also worse control. It is why her spells either burn her targets to ashes or simply fizzle out. There is no in-between. One of these days, I shall have to devise a way for her to use her magic effectively. Letty, I did it. Beautiful work, my lady. We have descended to the twentieth floor underground, yet we still haven't encountered any particularly tough enemy. I was thinking that if we can't find any good items then we could substitute with monster materials, but at this rate, maybe going to the bottom floor would be faster. Then let us hurry. Yoan should already be deeper in. How strange. I had let Yoan go first so that he would clear the way for us. Yet I have also found monster corpses in some rather unexpected locations, in paths that the younger brother did not take. Did they split into two teams? We are now at the thirtieth floor. Excuse me, my lady. Where Letty? I pick my lady up and start running. Bare moments later, rocks fall from the ceiling where we used to be. I have noticed traps there. I have also not triggered them. Tea traps? Yes, my lady traps. I catch the sound of far-off running footsteps. As I expected, that was a human trap, one leveraging the dungeon zone. I did think it was about time and indeed, they haven't betrayed my expectations. Please continue to hold on, my lady. A. Eh? We're running through. R. With my lady holding on to me for dear life, I run deeper into the dungeon. She. Jiggles. Quite a bit. I hop to the side to dodge a sudden arrow flying toward us from the front. Before the second could be let loose, I silence the men hiding in the shadows with made kicks. Plot. Um. Letty. What was that? It sounded like fruits being crushed. Something like that. 
My lady, I think even their seeds are ruined now. The two men foaming at the mouth aren't anyone I've seen at the castle. I wonder who they are. They don't seem to be bandits. I would have liked to interrogate them with my truth serums, but I don't have the time at the moment. I continue running. After that, we encounter a few more sporadic traps. Letty, there's a boulder coming toward us. Yes, my lady. It feels like we're being led somewhere. The boulder chases us to a wide open room without a floor, and we fall. Eep, do not worry, my lady. It's less a pitfall and more like an atrium that connects two floors together. It has two doors. Both are closed. After landing on my feet, I place my lady down. She looks up in unease. Maybe, this is also a trap. I reply. Indeed. I turn to look at where the new voice came from. One of the doors open and several people appear, Miss Akairu, why are you here, to judge your crimes, Miss Sharon, accompanying the Lady Akairu is a gaggle of young maids, all armed and pointing their weapons at my lady and me, they look fearful, you are accused of planning Yo An's assassination, how terrible, Sharon, I cannot believe you would do that to your own brother, wait, no, I would never do anything like that, I have evidence provided by Madame Jidel herself. Akairu takes out several sheets of paper, thrusting them to my lady's face. You have no excuses now. Sha, why did you not bring these to the town guards? I interrupt, my head tilting in puzzlement. My lady shares the gesture. Akairu stands in slack jawed silence. It takes a while for her to respond. Huh? If you already have all the evidence, why not take it to the palace or even the local town guards be but? Akairu stammers, her eyes darting to and fro. The young maids begin to chatter in anxiety. T this is supposed to be a judgment scene. Akairu lowers her gaze as her voice shrinks into a whisper, having lost all of its former fervor. Really? Wasn't she supposed to have come from Earth? Did she forget about the existence of police? May I have a look? I say. R. Yes. Akairu absentmindedly allows me to look at the so-called evidence. It's a sales receipt of the purchase of a rather special kind of poison, and on it is my lady's signature. This is not my lady's handwriting. Eh? I suppose that with the power a Marquis house has, they can make it work even with such a shoddy piece of evidence. But I would be surprised if it actually fools anyone. Miss Akairu, do not listen to her. The voice is of a man's, and it comes from behind the group of maids who are currently confused by the unexpected development. Mr. Dario. Miss Akairu, that maid might as well be a demon with how easily she can lie to your face without blinking an eye, we haven't given the evidence to the guards only because the madam wishes to grant Lady Sharon a chance to redeem herself, is that so? Indeed, as long as we have the evidence, Lady Sharon won't be able to talk her way out of it. For the house of Michelle, we will have her atone for her crimes here and now. A, eh? wow, well, this is for young Master Yoan, Lady Akairu. Everyone, ready your weapons. With an upward swing, my orc killer Rex finds its target. Nice shot, Dario gurgles. Letty. My lady exclaims, shocked, it seems Sir Dario is not being sound of mind, is there a doctor around? Akairu and the maids furiously shake their heads, they look rather pale, for some reason. As for Dario, despite his frothing bubbles and convulsions, he still lives, perhaps due to his armor, as I could not let my lady's eyes be tainted, I had been very careful with my strike. Still, I doubt he can continue to live as a man from tomorrow onward. Really, so useless. Madame Jidel, Madame, upon hearing the woman's voice echoing from above, Akairu and the maids look up, exclaiming in surprise mixed with relief. Jidel is standing not at the door where the two of us fell from, but on another protruding platform. Accompanying the woman is an elderly maid and some armed men. She looks down, her gaze frosty. Good work, Akairu. We can finally make Sharon atone for her crimes now. Be but. Akairu stumble over her words. She stares at the evidence, her disarrayed thoughts apparent on her face. I had hoped that that butler and you working together would be able to deal with Sharon. How disappointing. A pity, too. I thought you could have made for a good daughter. And Madame Jidel? Akairu's face pales, while a fearful uncertainty spread through the young maids. The door opposite to the one Akairu's group used slowly creaks open. Eek. Somebody squeaks. The thing that entered slowly scans its gaze around, and it roars. Grara Awah. It is a humanoid monster nearly three meters tall, with the head of a bull and a pair of enormous horns. A minotaur. My lady whispers, her voice quivering, 
This is one of the boss rooms on the lower floors. Apparently this room leads to a shortcut if you can defeat the Minotaur, so why don't you try? Oh, yes, which reminds me, Yoan had taken the safe route. Do not fear for him. Jidel says, laughing in genuine mirth. My lady glares at her. Madam Jidel, what are your intentions? You would even involve Lady Akairu, one of His Highness Joel's partner candidates. Are truly regrettable. Akairu was simply unfortunate to have been entangled in your crimes, that was all. It can't be. My lady whispers in abject disbelief, while Akairu slumps to the ground upon hearing Jidel's words. Her expression one of sheer despair. Graach, the Minotaur picks that exact moment to roar and charge toward Akairu. I don't plan on saving her. She's probably immortal too, anyway. What I didn't expect, however, is for my lady to shout a warning and jump toward Akairu in an attempt to save her. Watch out. My lady covers Akairu with her own body. Before the Minotaur's axe could reach its target, I smack the weapon away with my spiked club. I bring the two to safety my lady. I am fine. Letty. A trickle of blood drips from her forehead, likely from a piece of flying debris. Despite that, she still gives me a brave smile. Akairu shivers, her teeth chattering, and her gaze is fixed on my lady. Miss Akairu. May I leave my lady in your care? Be but. I. Akairu looks ready to cry. Out of guilt. Perhaps. I look at her icily. If you harm her even a hair further. I I won't. I swear I won't. What a gaff I've made. Underestimating my lady's kindness. So they really want to see me go all out, then? A.N. Our Lady Sharon is an angel. 17. Demon. Jidel was born as the first child to the Count of Bala. Theirs was not a particularly wealthy noble family. They had land, but their land had neither any dungeons nor industries of noteworthy value. The Bala Count wasn't content with his lot. He made ventures into multiple lines of business only to end in failures after failures, and his debt to other noble houses grew and grew. It was at that time that the Michel Marquis of the previous generation decided to grant him a loan. In return, the Marquis wanted Jidel to be the second wife for his heir, a young man who had just gotten engaged. The Michelet's engagement was with a young woman who was close to the Queen, while the lady had been adopted by a Viscount. Originally, she was born as nothing more than a simple daughter of a knight. Even if the couple themselves did not mind, it was still enough justification for the noble world to look down on them. So the Michel Marquis had thought that by bringing Jidel, the daughter of a count, into their family, then they would be able to maintain their status, on the surface at least, if nothing else. End of Block 1